Dick out to keep working with Dick, um, uh, Linda and Barbara. Barbara, are you back? I am here. Did that help? To, did, were you able to get back in? I am able to get back in. Um, and Trusty Santos is is on the call. He's um, he's just not able to unmute. Uh, can we mute him from our side? I can ask him to unmute. Let's, let's see. I am a co-host. Uh, let's see. Santos, Santos, Santos. I believe on the phone, if you press star seven, it will unmute. That's him at one four zero eight three five eight. I just uh, it's star six. It should be the correct code to unmute and to mute. Six. Oh. Hey, let's go. Ahead, we're gonna go ahead and do this. Um, you guys can keep working with um Dick. Oh God, poor Dick. Um. Oh. 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 Okay, that's one mute. Okay. Okay. Well, look, um, let's go ahead and call this meeting um, to order and look through the roll. Um, Andrew. Here. Recording in progress. Great. Uh, Sunita. I'm here. Word. Yes, I'm here. Eshwar. I'm here. Dick is here. Dick, can you hear if you can hear us? Uh, Set off a large explosion in Alviso, so we knew there. Um, Vince? Here. Great. Um, and as of two days ago, we've got uh, our old friend uh, Franco back. Franco, you on? I'm here. And uh, I'd like to welcome our newest member. We, we all met him at a board meeting a couple of years ago, Dave Wilson. Dave, you here? Dave, you might be on mute. Yeah, I'm here. Are you here, Dave? I see. I see you, Dave. Dave? Well, I don't. I see Dave is here. Uh, I'll he's, record. He, yes. But, Drew, he's not. He's okay. Not so he's trying to get back on. He was on. Okay, that's fine. And Nick, are you going to stick with us through the performance evaluation piece? Uh, my plan is to just sit quietly in the background, Drew, and. Um, just kind of fit right off into the sunset, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm picturing Audie Murphy on the back end of a camel. Okay. That's me. Perfect. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead and put us into closed session. Whoever...
president. We're all back from close. We have nothing to report on closed session. We just gathered input for the uh, performance reviews for Roberto uh, and Prabhu, which are due uh, next month. Um, Roberto, we, we went first, right? Federated's going to do theirs later this month, right? That, that is correct. Uh, there's a deal for the same uh, closed session discussion of the meeting in two weeks. Uh, that's August 19th. Right. And then you were called, Roberto asked, uh, based on past history, um, that we delay our September board meeting from September 2nd to September 9th. So we would have time to incorporate uh, that feedback and, and to handle the review process. Thanks for staying ahead of that, Roberto, make sure we had enough time to do a thorough job. Um, let me give you the orders of the day. Uh, first of all, we, we've got uh, a new face with us, Maytag Chin, um, who is Harvey number two. Harvey uh, is out, what, knees, getting his knee done, Maytag, is that what it is? That's correct, yeah, he's got knee surgery that he had done earlier this week and is recovering, so he should be back next week. Oh, good surgery, went well, Harvey's all good. Yep, he's doing well. well. Yep, That's he's great. Uh, on the mend. So we welcome you, uh, Maytag. We've always got a one and a two, and it's good to have you on our team. Um, let's see. Um, we got an, a note from the city that asked to defer item 4C on FLSA pay, and we're happy to do that. We, we got a great email. I love you, Vince. We got a great email from Vince just saying, if I can paraphrase, you know, guys, um, how about we slightly shuffle the agenda so we don't talk about the future because <laughs> before we talk about the present? So item 2B, um, the pension obligation bonds, we're going to do in the meeting after item 4D, where we talk about the performance of last year. And thanks for pointing out, Vince, it's probably more helpful to talk about the present before we talk about the future. So good catch there. Um, and just a reminder, we have pretty good uh, Zoom etiquette. If you want to interrupt a speaker to ask a temporal question, go ahead and feel free to do that. But in general, if you have some higher level comments, some general comments, why don't you wait till their presentation is over and we'll do a round robin. And we'll also do a round robin um, when you vote. I will make the note that there is no uh, sunshine that needs to be waved. So on to the agenda. Let's see. Um, does anybody want to pull anything off the consent calendar? Yeah, 1.6C, Drew. Yeah. Okay. Let me. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Vince. Uh, let's go ahead. Let's go and pull and talk about it now, and then we'll vote on the whole thing. Go ahead, so the, the transcripts from our last meeting are not available, and um, I guess I was a little surprised when I looked at this and, and looked at the um, assignments. I thought what happened was that I was on audit, and Sunita was put on governance. Oh, maybe that, I. I no, I think that's I think that's right, Linda. Do you do you recall, Linda? It's not what the minutes reflect. Oh, it is not. You know, I I didn't read that thoroughly, Vince. That's a good catch. Um, Sunita, do you recall? I think that's yeah. right. So you were going to go to governance, right? No, no, I was a standby on governance. Okay. And then you uh, thought that it would be good for me to be on the audit risk committee until okay. the end of the year when you might step down from the IC. Yep, yep, and that's right. I think that's yeah, my I'm happy point. with that, Drew. Um, believe me, audit risk okay. is not my area, so I'm fine. I just want to make sure I didn't miss something there. Um, anybody else notice anything that might be awry on this? I'm looking. But I mean, I don't remember that I was too. replacing Vince. That, that's part I don't remember. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I think that's right. Um, I, I'll, I'm going to make a note, but after this meeting is over, I'm going to loop back and just make sure this is right. Vince, we'll, we'll take a look at the, our notes. I'm just looking at my notes from the meeting from uh, June. And, uh, I do recall there was a conversation about uh, bringing you to the audit. But I also recall the statement by, uh, Drew about keeping Sunita uh, in governance. So let us take a look at compare notes and then the, if there's anything to be fixed, we'll make sure that it's fixed for the next meeting. So thank you for, for bringing this up. 
One of those Thank rare you. times for the fact that we're on tape, it might come in handy. Um, anybody else want to pull anything else off the um, consent calendar? Um, if not, I'll, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second, Santos. Um, do I have a first? <laughs> oh, I'll make the motion, the motion sorry. Okay, so uh, Sanzeri so first, Santos second. Uh, let's go round robin. I'm on the vote. Uh, Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. And Sunita, how do you vote? Aye. Howard? Yes. Shvar? Aye. Uh, Franco? Aye. Dick? Yes. Vince? Aye. And Dave? Aye. That's great. Um, so, Prabhu, why don't you give us your update, but but we're going to hold um, per Vince's excellent suggestion. We're going to hold POB until after we hear from Chiron. Um, so, Prabhu, over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, trustees. Hope you had a good July. Uh, welcome, Trustee Wilson. Welcome back, Trustee Waddle. Look forward to working with you both. Um, just wanted to share some numbers. Um, so as you all know, we had a very strong year. Last fiscal year was a record-breaking year. The police and fire pension plan returned 26.49%. In dollar terms, that was over a billion dollars, billion dollars and 12 million, billion, 12 million dollars just in terms of investment returns. And the healthcare trust returned 24.41%. And, uh, I want to thank the boards for their support uh, this past fiscal year. Uh, you're not, not only engaged, but you're also well informed and I look forward to your continued advice. I want to thank the investment team for actually taking advantage of all the investment opportunities that presented themselves in the past year. And I also want to thank our investment consultants for their sage advice. Um, but as you all know, past is not prologue in investments and we have a challenging year ahead of us. Um, as of August 3rd for this fiscal year, we are up 57 basis points. And calendar year to date, we are up 9.69%. That's more academic than anything else, but at least it gives us an indication of what the market's done uh, this calendar year. Uh, there's lots to worry about in the market. Uh, there's inflation, uh, there's the Delta variant, there's COVID thing won't just go away. Um, but against this backdrop, we have a very strong economy. Uh, I'm very positive on the economy. But I think the biggest worry really for us is given that we've had such a strong year, our capital market assumptions are going to come even lower going forward. And that's going to be a huge challenge for us as we try to match that six and five eights. So lots to talk about in the months ahead, both at the investment committee as well as um, at the board. And lastly, I wanted to inform the board that Dinesh has actually been promoted to Brian's role. Uh, so please join me in congratulating Dinesh. Uh, those are big shoes to fill, but J Dinesh has been a spectacular performer for us the past few years. And I'm sure with your, with your support, he will do well. And Brian has graciously agreed to transition Dinesh into this role over the next uh, over the next over the next several weeks. That concludes my comments, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will wait. Uh, we will hold off on two B as per your suggestion, but I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Uh, thanks. For floor is open. If anybody has any questions for Prabhu, Drew, I have a question. Sure. Um, for Prab Prabhu, if that's okay. You there? Yes, Am I here? Okay. Um, so, uh, just to get an understanding of the numbers, 26.49% return on the pension. And uh, is that fiscal year then? That is, yes, the past fiscal year ending June 30th. That's correct. Okay. And uh, could you possibly, you said a uh, billion dollar increase in return? That is a billion, 12 million just in investment returns. Okay, 
Great. I want to be able to report out accurately at the city council meeting. Thank you. Sure. And don't forget to bring a couple of bottles of champagne when you do, Pam. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good. It's a good number. It's 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 good to be the king, as they like yeah. to say. Congratulations. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Any other questions for Prabhu? Yeah. Drew, if I could ask uh, Prabhu something. Um, so just, uh, I know we have, uh, you know, talked about risk from investing in China before, and I think some of those things have played out in recent weeks. Uh, any any thoughts on it? Uh, anything in terms of risk to our portfolio? Uh, yes, we have looked at it, Trustee Menon, and in fact, we have a presentation that's going to be made at the, at the next IC. I know Christina has worked diligently on it and has been in touch with our managers. And so we'll have a more detailed presentation at the IC in August. Uh, but just for the board and uh, for everyone else to know, we are underweight China. And so that has worked in our favor. And we do rely on our active managers to keep a watchful eye on that. Thank you. Any other uh, questions, <clears throat> excuse me, for Prabhu? Hey, Prabhu. Um, so a question for you, any... Um, thoughts from some of the round tables, et cetera, you've been attending uh, across the pension industry around dealing with the negative tenure real rates? Yeah, I mean, that continues to be a challenge. I think it perplexes everyone. And, you know, the, I mean, what, what should you do with your bond exposure, right? And what should you do in this environment with, with those negative rates? I think, I think it's a conundrum, right? I mean, on the one hand, uh, low rates are good for equities in the long run. Um, but at the same time, uh, what is this? I mean, we, we see inflation numbers on the one hand, but we see the bond market telling us something else. So there's, there's no real clear answer and there's no consensus on it. I think those who are more tactical are worried about inflation. And I think that's something that we should explore more in the months ahead, uh, unexpected inflation. Uh, but I think from a longer term perspective, I, I feel confident with our risk profile uh, going forward. Uh, but we should we should be prepared for nasty shocks in terms of inflation. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Prabhu? Um, I'll notice that, that we don't have any continuing open items, which is good because we're going to shift focus the pension obligation bonds in the next meeting or two. Um, so that brings us to um, section four. Over to you, Roberto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I believe what you mentioned was we will have now <clears throat> the presentation from uh, Bill Hallmark at Chiron uh, regarding the um, updated pension projections on preliminary investment returns as of June 30th, 2021. Um, big reach out to me and Prabhu and indicated that now that the original projections, I think were around the 20% range and the final numbers, as I think Prabhu shared with everyone this morning is more in the 20, at least for the police and fire in the 26% uh, return range. And so what Kyron did was they updated uh, the actual information for the two board back in June, uh, primarily for a couple of reasons. The first one, obviously, uh, I think it makes sense for everyone to have um, a, a more um, uh, specific and uh, realistic uh, information on, on the actual results uh, for the fiscal year, June 30, 2021. And it's also a way to... to um, relay the latest information to all stakeholders, including the city, who can take this information and uh, use it in their, uh, in their uh, thinking and, and decision on whether or not to move forward on the POB and if they uh, have more would like to flow. In fact, um, I want to let you know that uh, Prabhu and I had a meeting with uh, will be this week in July, last week, and the uh, city staff uh, uh, will be coming forward before I uh, meet with a presentation uh, for the pension obligation bond uh, from the city standpoint. So uh, we're coming before you. Uh, 
in the meantime, his uh, the, um, invest the fiscal. Um, if you have a chance, let uh, I'll let uh, comment on the specifics. Uh, this presentation includes uh, the input those returns on an MRA. So anything out that um, definitely concentrate. On basis, as, as Prabhu kind of hinted uh, a few minutes ago, um, you know, those returns can be here today and tomorrow, depending on how the market uh, behaves in the next 12 months. I think that, that if there are going to be any kind of decisions or, or projections made, uh, the actuarial numbers uh, actually makes a lot more sense. So, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Bill. Hello, did you want me to go ahead and go into 4D? Yes, please. Hey, hey, hang, on one, hang on one second, Bill. Um, Roberto jumped the gun slightly. Uh, let's do Councilwoman Foley first. That's on our agenda in that order. But just a brief delay, Bill, stay tuned. Councilwoman sure. Foley, over to you. Great, thank you very much. I actually don't have a lot to report on today because we just returned to City Hall on Monday and it's like being back to school for the first day. You know, you have to get used to where you are, seeing your, your okay. associates again, figuring out where your classrooms are. It was really fabulous to be back in council chambers on Tuesday. I really was happy to be there. It made me smile to be there. Even though I was in a mask, I was trying to smile with my eyes. It's also wonderful to see the our staffs there and to be able to interact with them in a one-on-one -on -one basis without having to Zoom at meetings. Um, although today I am home because I have two back-to-back -back Zoom meetings, this one and another one. So here I am again Zooming. Um, just one, uh, regarding City Hall, it is open to the public, but by appointment only in most departments. It's a soft phasing in. We are uh, very concerned, of course, of, with the Delta virus, so everyone needs to check in, all employees do, and of course, we're all wearing masks throughout City Hall. I did want to bring to your attention that uh, we are requiring vaccinations following suit uh, like the county and the state government is requiring vaccinations of all of our employees by August 23rd. That includes police and fire and everybody. Um, it's requiring proof of vaccinations or uh, mandatory weekly uh, negative COVID testing. Uh, there's an ability for an employee to get testing free through a couple of uh, sites that we can refer them to, or they, uh, if they go somewhere else, they will have to uh, pay for their own, own site, own uh, testing. But we will, we're, we'll, we'll be giving them an hour uh, of their staff time to take off to get this work, get that done. So either testing or. Uh, vaccinations. That's as of the 23rd, with the potential to go to uh, full vaccinations and, and eliminating the the testing component uh, later in the in depending on how the Delta variant is going. So that's the latest update, and that's the news as of last night as far as mandatory uh, vaccinations and and testing. And with that, I don't really have anything else to report because we haven't had much of a council meeting yet. Thanks, Jim. Okay, any uh, questions if anybody has them? Any questions for Mr. Councilman? Good, Roberta. Mr. Chair, so a couple of things. I do have a question for council member, but I just wanted to also, um, I guess I misunderstood your direction. You had asked me to go first with my other report, which I'm happy to report in a couple of seconds after I asked the question to council member and I joined directly to the presentation by Cameron. So apologies uh, for that. No um, worries. <laughs> uh, Council member, uh, our boards are going to continue their um, regular 
board meetings through Zoom, presumably through September 30th. I, I was interested in understanding um, or listening to you to the experience by city council, uh, because I believe the city council uh, is pursuing a hybrid approach, right? You can actually be at the city chambers, but you could also attend through Zoom. Is that correct? The city council meetings, that is correct. And I was just wondering, how did it go that first meeting? Uh, was that uh, pretty straightforward? There were not that many issues having um, uh, many of you present and maybe some uh, participants through Zoom. Was, did that work uh, um, smoothly? All of the council members were present in person. It would, so the, those that were only uh, virtual were members of the public who called in. Staff was there present in person as well. If it, where the problem would have occurred is, or the, the logistical concerns would have been if some, stat, some council members were virtual and some were in person because then voting would have been different. And uh, the mayor recognizing who's in line to speak also would have been different. So he encouraged us all to be in person and, and we are in person. But uh, so when through the end, there's a, a executive order that allows committees to meet virtually through the end of the end of September. Beyond that, uh, commissions, our commissions will be required to meet. They can meet virtually, but they need to, the commissioners need to post their addresses which means any member of the public could show up at their address. And so we're trying to work through the legislature to change that. It's a modification to the Brown, the Brown Act, which would allow commissioners to participate without disclosing that, that kind of information. So that's that might affect your committee. Um, you have to talk to your legal counsel to see how that affects the retirement board, whether you can do that or not, or whether you have to have your addresses posted publicly. I don't mind my address being posted publicly because frankly, I'm elected and I'm really easy to find. But those of you who uh, are in other businesses or don't want to be, uh, you, haven't, you haven't taken that step to say, I want anyone to just knock on my door and come into a meeting. That's not likely to happen, but it could happen. Does that answer your question, Roberto, or did I really get off track with well, that? Y yes. No, no, no. Yes, it does. The reason I ask, Council Member, and for the uh, board benefit is, uh, again, we we'll continue uh, Zoom meetings through September 30th, but after that, as of right now, as you know, uh, and uh, of video on the law would expire September 30th, and which will be uh, October being per. And I just want to hear in the event that we do have in-person meetings, but also choose to go with the Zoom option, uh, logistically, whether that was the main reason for, for my question. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. The, the hybrids seem to work as long as everybody was in the same place, the, the committee. Hey, Roberto, this is me, Section. Um, We'd be happy to look into the Brown Act issue regarding the posting of addresses for you. Very well, thanks. I do know that before that the flexibility, if a member of the board was going to be handing remote, yes? Roberto, you're breaking up a little bit. I don't know if that's just me or if that's everyone's hearing the breakup. No, I, I think it's, I think everyone is hearing the break about thinking maybe my Wi-Fi, I probably should have gone to the office today for the meeting, I apologize. Um, but thank you, Mayda, just let us know. Uh, Mr. Chair, would you like me to do my order report update now or you would like me to leave it for later? Roberto, whatever you want to do, maybe do it now because I think we're going to a long session here okay. with the next two items. Well, thank you. Let me. Councilmember member uh, falling for uh, most of the information. Um, we are still parallel with the city, but quite honest, we're a bit behind from the standpoint that very, very soft opening. 
we do have a handful of staff that uh, goes by the office a couple of days a week. Uh, in fact, we have been doing that for some months now. We are uh, right now comparing a couple of the appointments applications so that we can, uh, once it's available to us, implement one and uh, have the public uh, to uh, to their so right now the office is closed uh, on like the city which is actually right now open by appointment only we are not open yet once that appointment uh, application is available to us we are considering opening uh, to the public uh, most likely uh, at this point it will be sometime late August so most likely right after Labor Day weekend Staff had a meeting with uh, our staff uh, last Friday, uh, in which we discussed a survey uh, of questions that uh, we sent to our employees uh, to uh, understand their concerns about the return to the office approach. Uh, for the most part, everyone rather work from home, but understand that we need to start our way back to the office, and, and they will appreciate two things. Number one. Uh, this a couple of weeks or more so they can make arrangements to if we could uh, consider the hybrid approach which is something that senior staff support completely so when we are ready to opening the doors even if it's an appointment approach basis to our members and we start having more staff come into the office uh, it will be a hybrid approach uh, i will be happy to share more details on those plans uh, with both boards as we get closer to that day um, I also wanted to let you know um, that I'm very excited to uh, report that we hire a brand new uh, benefits manager. So uh, congratulations uh, to the staff and to the deputy director for a, a magnificent job uh, going through that process. Um, and our new benefits manager who actually starts this coming Monday, August 9th is Sandra, Sandra Castellano. Sandra has worked for the city for over 24 years. Uh, she actually started her career uh, with HR at the city and is coming to us from um, uh, DOT, Department of Transportation, um, uh, which is, she's part of their senior staff at this point. Again, she started with us this coming Monday. Um, if, if Sandra's last name sounds familiar to you, it's because Sandra is, is uh, the former chair, federated uh, uh, trustee, Jay Castellano's spouse. Uh, she is now going to be a member of our senior staff at the office, which really uh, meant that trustee Castellano uh, had to resign uh, his position at the federated board in order for us to consider her application. So uh, for those of you that do not know, uh, former chair Castellano for federated is no longer a trustee of the federated board. I also want to share with you a couple of personal issues. We promoted uh, Tammy Imai, her uh, staff specialist role to uh, a recent benefit analyst position uh, that happened last July 17. Um, we have another benefit staff that left uh, city employment uh, last month, and we are actually in the search process performing interviews um, this week. Uh, they were here last week for this position. Um, in addition to that, uh, one of our four retired Terry not to come back to us as a uh, to help uh, onboarding uh, new benefit analysts. Um, I think I mentioned to you, you had a presentation on the website uh, last June. The website did go live uh, in mid-June. Uh, and it's been a success, um, uh, as I mentioned before, that uh, uh, website uh, is a new approach, uh, obviously more friendly and easy to, 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 to follow and more updated information. And um, it's, uh, it's an in-process uh, work in progress in that we are always looking for improvements. And we will ask you that as you go through the website and take time, to uh, let us know if you have any comments uh, uh, and, and ways that we can improve that website so that we uh, can be more user-friendly for our stakeholders. You saw also that we issue our retiree connection newsletter uh, last month in July. 
And uh, that concludes my updates, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm happy to address any specific questions. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions for Roberto? Uh, if not, Bill, I hate to do this to you, but um, I think we're about to go into a very long session. So it's just about, it is exactly 1030. Let's take a five minute uh, bio break and I'll resume at 1035. Sorry about that, Bill. No problem, sounds good. All right, we'll see you guys back in five.
All right, let me uh, share my screen here. So can everyone see my screen? Coming through line clear, Bill. All right. Yes. So uh, as Roberto indicated, we wanted to give you an update on the pension projections with the uh, preliminary investment returns. Um, so uh, we put this together uh, based on the returns that Prabhu had very shortly after June 30th, which were 25.25%. They are preliminary returns, and we are basing these just on that percentage number and updating our model. Uh, there are going to be changes due to uh, different cash flows and due to the liabilities, and then uh, we will also be considering assumption changes and those sorts of things. But uh, th this level of return significantly <laughs> changes uh, things going forward. And so we wanted to get that information out and share it. Uh, but you shouldn't view these as firm numbers for 2021 uh, at all, because we've still got a process to go through. And then going forward, they assume all of our assumptions continue to be met. But with that said, uh, this is what we expected uh, for the year from the 2020 valuation. We started with a market value of around 3.7 billion. We expected contributions from the city and members and about 245 million in uh, investment earnings. Uh, and then we had to pay out benefits and so forth. And so we were projecting assets of about 3.9 billion at the end of the year. Uh, given the six and five eighths percent return. But the actual return at 25.25 was uh, almost 700 million more than expected. And um, now with the latest numbers, 26.49, it'd be even higher. And so that, uh, in these projections, we have not updated for any other changes in the cash flow. Uh, and those uh, percentages, uh, percentage earnings are uh, usually done on a time weighted basis, so they don't take into account cash flows. So there will likely be some adjustments by the end of the year, but we're looking at an estimate of about 4.6 billion in assets, uh, almost 700 million more than we had projected before. That's sort of like if the city made four times their contribution uh, during the year. So that's a pretty big change for us. We had projected, we were 71% funded based on the market value of assets. We had projected with six and five eighths percent return that we'd go to 73% funded. Uh, but with this return, we're now projecting 85% funded uh, based on the market value of assets uh, as of June 30th. When you project that out, uh, this line shows the prior projection of assets and the green bars show the updated projection. We're now projecting to get to 100% funding in 2030, which is nine years earlier than the prior projection. Uh, again, assuming we get six and five eighths returns uh, going forward. But contributions react a little more slowly because we base those on the actuarial value of assets instead of the market value. And the actuarial value smooths the investment gains and losses over five years. We haven't talked a lot about the actuarial value uh, for several years uh, because it's been very close to the market value, but we're gonna see a little bit of a divergence here. Uh, if you look back at the last five years, our gains and losses in 2017, we had a gain of about 80 million. 2018, we just about hit our assumption on the nose. 
2019, we had a loss of 127 million and 2020, a loss of 114 million. Now we're looking at a gain of 690 million for 2021. It really dwarfs those, those prior changes. But we recognize 20% of those variations each year. And so the 2017 gain has now been fully recognized. 2018, there's only 20% left, and it was small to start with. Uh, and you can see there are pieces left of the 2019 and 2020 losses. But the big piece left is the 80% of that 690 million is not recognized in the 2021 valuation. So we do this to stabilize contributions. It stabilizes things both going up and down. Um, and the result here is to get the actuarial value, we start with the market value, uh, add in the losses that we haven't recognized, subtract the gains we haven't recognized. And so our actuarial value is going to be um, like 430 million lower than the market value. This is just to quickly show that uh, what we projected for the market value and what's actually come in is significantly different on the actuarial value is just slightly different. Uh, so actuarial value, we're only projecting an increase to 77% funded, uh, whereas it's 85% on market value. So when we look at contributions in the 2020 valuation, uh, we'd expect the co contributions to increase from 217 million to about 224 million. Uh, and these are the city's contributions. Uh, but with the return, it's going to drop uh, to about 210 million in total. And so that's going from about 87% of pay down to 82% of pay. So it's still a high percentage of pay. We can look at it with the different tiers, and you can see that the uh, tier one uh, is where the reductions are. In tier two, those rates are still pretty low. There's not much UAL piece in them anyway, and there's a limit uh, to normal costs. So those contributions are not affected nearly as much as if we're looking at the total and the tier one. So it's primarily that tier one UAL piece that's being affected. And then if we look at it projected out, the blue line is our projection from the 2020 valuation. And the bars represent the updated projection for the city's contributions. And you can see that we start diverging right away, but the divergence grows substantially uh, over the next five years as we recognize all of those gains. Uh, and so there's a, you know, we get to about a $78 million difference here in 2027. Uh, it gets larger to about 92 million by 2029. Uh, so it's quite a difference in those projections. Here we're looking at it as a percent of the projected pay. <clears throat> and again, we've got a projection of a fairly quick step down uh, to uh, contributions in the 50s, 50% 50 instead of 80% of pay. Uh, now, these projections, again, assume that we get six and five-eighths percent returns going forward and that we assume six and five-eighths percent return. So we will revisit that, and Prabhu mentioned that the capital market assumptions uh, have gone down given the run-up in the market, and so um, we may revisit those assumptions, uh, which would change these projections. But the general direction of the projections is going to be the same. 
So just to sum up, we have preliminary returns putting us at around an 85% uh, funded ratio on the market value. We expect significant reductions in contributions over the next five years. The, the projections that we're showing here get you in the ballpark of what to expect, but they're gonna change when we get final asset information uh, if the board adopts new assumptions. And we have not looked at the new census data. So this is all based on who was working for the city and who was retired in 2020. We're just collecting that information now. And, and so that will have an effect uh, when we complete the 2021 valuation. So with that, uh, take any questions you may have, uh, or we can move on to the uh, exciting investment piece of the, the puzzle here. Yeah, no, let's let's go ahead and pause. Um, the floor is is open. I don't think I need to go around, Robin. If trustees want to jump in for with questions, go ahead. Really? No oh, questions. Drew Santos here. Okay. Bill, thank you for that. Uh, and I'm looking at this. And so when you, you uh, <clears throat> when you say Primary pension returns of 25%, basically explain that to me a little more. And, the, and then also the significant reduction in the contributions. Is it from the city, from the, the, from the employees? Could you go a little more of that? I appreciate it. Yeah, so the, uh, the preliminary pension return of 25% is what Prabhu uh, passed on, I think, on July 1st. So You're going to be a little, a little louder, please. I, I, that's hard to hear for whatever reason. So the, uh, the investment return of 25% is as of June 30th, 2021. And that was the preliminary return for uh, the pension that Prabhu had, I think on July 1st. He's updated that, so it's 26.5% now. Um, but that's, that's still preliminary. We don't have the final asset statements. So it may uh, swing around a little bit. Bill, is your volume all the way up? Because mine is all the way up and it is very difficult for me to hear you. Uh, my volume is all the way up. Can other people hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm, I, I hear you, you fine. Hear you fine, Dick. Can you turn your volume up? He's coming through loud and clear for me. My volume is all the way up. I wouldn't have asked anybody to do something if I wouldn't take care of me first. So I'm fine. Just keep going. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, Dick. No, he's, he, your, your volume and his volume, at least just now, are the same as to me. Anybody else have any questions uh, for Bill? Uh, Mr. Chair, can I ask a Sure. Uh, jump in. Uh, he didn't uh, finish answering the contributions. Yeah. Let me, let me address the contribution question he asked. These are uh, what we were showing are the city's contributions. The member contributions are largely unaffected by the investment returns. There is some effect on the tier two members, uh, but very minor effect because uh, they did not have much of a UAL payment anyway. So these are primarily reductions in the city's contributions on the tier one UAL. Um, I don't know if Roberto is gonna ask, but I had a quick question, uh, actually a comment, which, which is that I would echo what, what Prabhu said, which is that we should expect that expected future returns uh, will come down just given you know, what the markets have done. Um, and hopefully any decisions in terms of city contributions um, and, and, and you know, benefits, things like that, you know, we are more careful and just take a longer term approach. Um, I had a quick question. Um, Go ahead, jump in. Everybody jump in. Go ahead, Sunita. Is it fair to say so at a 25%, is that an annual return, the pension, preliminary pension return? The 25%. Yeah, that's the 
preliminary return for the year ending June 30th, 2021. Okay. So to be, just theoretically, to be almost 100% funded, we went from 73 to 85% funded. That's about 12% um, with a 25% return. So we need, let's say we need another 12% roughly to be close to 100. So we need another 25% year, so to speak. Um, <laughs> which obviously is, uh, to Ishwar's point, is uh, unrealistic. No problem. Prabhu is working on it. <laughs> uh, Roberto, do you want to jump in? Thank you, Ms. Yeah, so uh, thank you both, Eswar and uh, Sunita, for your comments. You're absolutely right. Do the and so hey, we're, 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 you're really choppy. So try turning off your video and, and try asking that again. Yeah. yeah, try now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good, good suggestion. Um, That's Bill, when I introduce you to the mm -hmm. difference between the market value and the actual value, and so I wanted to ask you, can you comment on that? Were, were my comments appropriate or did you feel differently about it? And can you comment on Perhaps, if I am correct, why should stakeholders, the board, and the city uh, should, when they think long term, uh, we should be making decisions and concentrating more on the actuarial value information? Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, so uh, the market value reflects the assets that you have in the fund. And so if you're making assessments about where you are right now, understanding that it bounces around, uh, you should be looking at the market value. <clears throat> we use the actuarial value to control the volatility of the contributions. And over time, the methods, if our assumptions hold, they will be the same. And so the actuarial value prevents you, the contributions from overreacting to short-term fluctuations in investment returns. And so that is the basis for uh, the contributions that we calculate is the actuarial value. So I think you need to monitor both and keep track of both, but understand how they are used uh, in the end, we pay the benefits with the market value of assets. Um, and so we definitely need to uh, keep track of those. Okay, so uh, understood. Thank you very much. I think uh, that is a little different but where I was thinking from. Uh, I know Prabhu is already working on another 25, that's what he just told me. <laughs> And uh, one soon uh, should expect expectation discussion that they said fiscal Roberto, you're breaking up a lot again. I'm sorry. Um, assuming a large return for 2022 we should then get a lot closer to 100% funded on a market value basis for 2022, right? Assuming another 25, 30% return. I would just be afraid that the city or the stakeholders in general will be making decisions, assuming that, you know, because of the market return, the, 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 the funding ratio of a plan is 28%, especially the following year, the, the plan loses 35% or 30% of return is going to go back to the low 80s. Uh, that's just my concern. I guess my point here is if, if, if I was the board, I want to make sure that the stakeholders and the city in general um, understand the, the implications of the market value versus the actuarial value when they're making decisions on the POB. That's all. Yeah, the, the market value is much more volatile. So 
when we've had a really good return, it goes up significantly. If get a drop, then so Bill, we're not hearing you either. You're breaking. That's going to be reflected immediately in the market value. Bill, you might want to turn your video off and go just audio because we can't um, hear you. You're breaking up. Everybody, it's okay, just I'm going to stop staring as well. Did that help? Yeah, that's strange. Is everybody else experiencing what I'm experiencing? It's just Roberto and now Bill. Everybody else seems okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Strange. I know that I know there's been reports in the global networks have been very saturated. Not a lot of kids, I think, are home summer watching movies and stuff, playing games. Uh Bill, can can you come in now? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, now you're loud and clear. Thanks. Okay. So uh, I think Roberto's point is that the market value of assets can be volatile. And if uh, we get a good return, we bounce up to 85. If we get another good return, we could bounce up to 100. Uh, but the market might uh, uh, recorrect after that. Uh, and you could have a significant drop in funded status. So. Uh, when you are looking at the market value funded status, you do have to recognize the volatility. And we will continue to be sh showing you different scenarios and the range of potential outcomes so that you can see that. Um, but you can't just lock in and think that we have no volatility going forward. The actuarial value has uh, some protections in it from smoothing that make it a more, much more stable number. Let me ask a different question, if I can here. This is Vince, um, Bill. So on a market value basis, we have approximately 700 million more in assets due to the strong returns. Assuming that that didn't happen, and instead that money came in in the form of a POB, what would that do to the market value and the actuarial value of assets? So they would both recognize the POB in the same way. They would, would so if we got 700 million in a POB, that would increase both the market value and the actuarial value by 700 million. So immediately that means the actuarial value would be 85% funded is what you're saying? Yes. Does this change, this outcome change at all? I know we're kind of front running the POB conversation, but is, does this, is there any specific input that you want to provide or share with us regarding POBs given this one year return? Uh, I think it affects the analysis of what, you know, whether you want to do a POB and how much. Uh, just because you're much closer to being 100% funded. And uh, so I think the analysis changes uh, the closer you get to 100% funded. Okay. Thank you. More questions for Bill? Um, if not, um, I'm going to take a little bit of chairman's license here and try to frame this debate, just as Vince just did. So I'm going to read this to you because I want to make sure I get it right. So where are we in space and time, right? So we had an underfunded plan. We've just gotten good news, but that's all very temporal. It's very tactical. Look, the city has for, has for uh, more than a year, they had a, a, a commission and we were part of that. The city is contemplating issuing pension obligation bonds in the hundreds of millions of dollars, possibly up you know, to a billion, maybe more. Look, that decision, as Harvey keeps reminding them, is theirs, not ours. 
our decision, should the city decide to issue pension obligation bonds and give us some of that money, is what to do with that money they might give us. Those decisions certainly inform each other, as Bill just said, but as Harvey keeps reminding us, those decisions must be made independently. So the right thing to do is for us and the city to bounce information back and forth, but not try to influence too much each other's decisions, other than to the extent Bill just did. Look, here's some actuarial facts. Said he go make your decision. Happy to share it with you. So it's our decision to think through what we might do with that money from POBs if the city were to issue them and give it to us, and to share that thinking with the city. And what you saw in Bill's presentation in June, and what you just saw in his, and what you see in, in Varys and Makia's present, Eileen's presentation to come, okay, is what might we do that, and how should we think about that? So for those of you who have been on the board for a while, Darren Miller used to work here, he's on our investment staff, and he said something at an offsite when Vince was chair, and I wrote it down, and it has spawned a lot of thinking. Darren said, and I quote, here at San Jose Pension, we don't have a culture of risk. Well, Darren, wherever you are now, I'll, I'll find you out and I'll send you an email. We do now. And that's thanks to Vince and staff, and, and I'll take some credit and all the other trustees, and Makita and Barris and Bill and anybody else. So risk is now at the center of everything we do. And more and more pension funds, public pension funds all around the world are figuring that out. So what's the question for us? The question for us is, what happens to our fund's risk if the city creates pension obligation bonds and give them to, give them to us? So let me try to frame up this debate. I might be wrong in framing it, but at least it's a starting point, it's a straw man. At some level, this is pretty simple. We picked a risk level. Varys and McKee have helped us do that, 12% volatility. And we use that risk level to pick an asset allocation, and we set our discount rate based on the forecast return we expect from that asset allocation with some slight modifications. We have some leeway, right? So if we take in more money from pension obligation bond and hold our volatility, hold our asset allocation, hold our discount rate constant, we would expect in the forecast, expect City contributions will go down. We got more money. We're generating six point something percent on that money. That's more money in our system. That's less money they need to put in. That's easy. But hang on, hang on. When Varys gave us their risk analysis, they also talked about the size of an absolute shock. So we all know we've seen it. The market goes up and down. We took advantage um, last. Uh, last calendar year of market, a market that went down and then blips back up again. So it's not just about the forecast, which pension obligation bond will help, right? Because we expect to return 6.7%, they might pay 3%, and that gap is good for us. But there's an absolute shock. If we have a $4 billion fund and the market goes down 25%, we lose a billion. If we have a $5 billion pension fund, we lose 25%, we lose $1.25 billion. And that $250 million of additional loss needs to be made up by the city. The city's contributions will go up. So we have a knob on the wall. It's a pretty simple knob, right? And if they add money, right? Ooh, that's good. And we might invest it. Let's just say we can invest anywhere we want to. Might, might throw it into our asset allocation bucket. That's great forecast city contributions are going to go down. Ferris comes in and says, ah, hang on, guys. At that offsite, we said, but there's also the absolute shock. And one of those will happen. We're all, we're all older people. We've been through 87 and 2008, right? So when that happens, their contributions will go up because a bigger fund creates a bigger hole when rates go down. So the core question is, I think in our analysis to give the city is, uh, okay, so we might choose to take a little risk out of the portfolio, right? We might choose because of that hole to go from 12% to say 11%, which would be a slightly more 
conservative risk averse asset allocation, a slightly lower discount rate, right? Okay, that, that makes perfect sense, right? That means we still might lower their contributions, right? But good news, because a little lower, the hole we leave is not quite so big. And God himself right now doesn't know quite what that number is. And we're going to hear from Varys as they try to hone in on it. So, so that's our core question, okay? If we're given this money, right, we have to think, what happens in a shock? And I've talked to Prabhu about this, Roberto and I've talked. And I think Varys at that offsite a couple of years ago started with that. And I think that's right. The analysis Bill does and just gave us is the starting point, and then we layer onto that, okay, but the forecast never happens. What happens in a shock? So I want everybody on this board to think, uh, we, we talked this analogy many times, we're in a train control room in the middle of a very large train yard surrounded by hundreds of knobs, right? We can do the discount rate, we have to look at mortality, we can do smoothing curves, right? But let's focus on just two of those knobs. They're the biggest two knobs. They're knobs we just talked about. They're in the center of the control room. And one of those knobs, this control room is not just us. The city has access to controls. One of those two knobs is our knob, and one of those knobs is their knob, right? Our knob says discount rate slash asset allocation slash volatility on it. We've chosen to link all those three together. We don't have to, but we've chosen to. And their knob says size of pension fund on. And as we turn our knob for volatility discount rate, and they turn their knob, it's your pension obligation bonds. Here's some more money for you guys. There's a giant bright readout right in the middle of the control room. It has a big display on it, lots of numbers. And that readout is, tiled, is titled status of San Jose's police and fire pension fund. And that display changes whenever we change our knob or the city changes it. And the top line of that display in bigger letters and characters than any other line in that display is something that says annual city contribution. And as we dial ours down, the contribution goes up. And as we dial ours up, the contribution goes down. And as I said before, in the forecast, as they add money from POBs, the contribution goes down, blah, blah, blah. And there's downturns, which is, I suppose, the devil's knob inside the control room, right? So let's see if by our next board meeting in September, working with staff and Varys and McKeith and Chiron, we can get some what ifs. Well, what if the city gives us 250 million? And what if we lower our discount rate by a bit? And you'll see in just a minute the preliminary thinking from, from Varys on this. And with some hard work and smart trustees which we've got in abundance and a pinch of luck, when we meet with the city in late September, we'll be able to have an intelligent conversation that says, we think this is what we would do if you were to give us pension obligation bond money. Now, take, given that city, it's your decision to see whether you want to do POBs or not. Our job is not to determine whether POBs are a good idea or not. Harvey's told us that. Our job is to say, if you were to give us POB city in certain amounts, that's part of the what if, this is what we think we'd do with them. And this is what Varys and Chiron say would happen both to forecast and to unforecast shocks. So that's, I'm going to turn it over to you now, Eileen. That's where we are. I think it's space and time. Let's listen to Eileen. And you are all welcome to say I'm out of my freaking mind. Uh, but over to you, Eileen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can everyone hear me all right? Coming through loud and clear, Eileen. Great. Uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and share my screen. So bear with me for a second. It's starting up. We, we see it now. Thanks, Eileen. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and put it on uh, full screen mode here. All right. 
So um, first of all, uh, thank you for um, setting up the uh, problem, um, uh, Mr. Chair. I think that is very helpful uh, for uh, the discussion that um, we're going to move forward with. And, and what we've done um, is prepare a couple of slides that focus on a couple of things. First is the decision framework because it's important to have a framework um, within which to have this kind of discussion and also um, to understand uh, the variables that feed into the, um, I think the key question, which is what is, what, what is our risk profile? What is the level of risk that we should take um, given uh, the potential impacts of the proceeds of a pension obligation bond. So on, on this slide, uh, slide eight, um, we give you a graphic representation, if you will, of our framework. So the framework in for this type of process is two variables, essentially, what is the required return that the plan needs to earn in order to meet the long-term objective, which is to fund, fully fund pension obligations. And there's two, there's two inputs for meeting that objective. One is earning a sufficient return, but the other is um, the external contributions that the city makes. And so that is why those two variables are shown in, on, on this slide. And so the, um, the starting point is essentially, you know, where you're at. You have a required rate of return of 6.625. Um, and you have uh, contributions at let's call it roughly the $200 million level or so forth. So once you get the pension obligation bond, um, you, you have two, two places that you can move. Um, as you mentioned, uh, contributions would be expected to, to go down. Um, you can, you can um, uh, manage what the board has control over that required return decision, i.e. you can choose to maintain the current discount rate, which should also be your required return of your um, or expected return of your asset allocation, and that's 6.625. Or as you indicated, gee, if we expect contributions to go down because our funded status is going up, maybe we can take some risk off the table. And as we know, there's a direct relationship between reducing risk and that required return. It generally reduces that return. And so that is uh, point, point C, essentially, um, if you decide to take risk off the table um, and, and lower that uh, required return, what that has an impact of doing is essentially keeping your contributions at the current level. So not increasing, but not showing the decrease that you would expect because you're looking for the contributions to fund more of that future growth you need to meet your, um, your uh, benefit obligations. Um, the pro of that type of approach is uh, that means that there's more stable income or reliable income to fund that growth, as opposed to point B is, you know what, we're going to keep the current level of risk, you know, we're comfortable and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that more on the, on the next slide in just a moment here, but we're comfortable at the level of risk that we're at and maintaining that kind of risk profile and that higher growth rate and what that will have um, the, the impact of doing is lowering that um, uh, contribution or the contribution level. So the, the, the pro of that is 
um, you know, obviously higher expected returns, but the con of that is, um, you know, the returns are not as certain as those annual contributions, right? So, so those are sort of the trade-offs that this framework um, presents, okay? So if we look at um, this next slide, we're focusing solely on, on risk. And you know, risk basically is the volatility of the, um, the required or expected returns. And the target, current target for the police and fire plan is 12%. And when this exercise was undertaken several years ago, um, these are the types of scenarios that, that we looked at, i.e., um, you know, where, what happens in terms of potential drawdowns if you increase risk from here, and what happens in terms of potential drawdowns if you decrease risk from here. So, um, again, uh, this target was arrived at by looking at different levels of risk and determining, you know, we can, we're, we're comfortable with taking the sort of risk where our maximum drawdown, expected drawdown for the asset allocation target is roughly 20% um, most of the time, 95% of the time. So um, that was information that you had as a board that fed into making that decision. And, and also um, the, the, the probability of that level of drawdown occurring was roughly 14 in 100. And, and, and you felt comfortable with that probability level. So what happens if you take risk off? So if we're looking at taking risk off or reducing risk, two things happen. Number one, the absolute drawdown amount declines, which is a good thing. That's something that, that, that is a, a, a benefit of that. However, if you take risk down, then the probability of having a drawdown, which causes you to miss having um, your required or target rate of return increases. So that's a con of taking risk off. And, and in here, we inserted 2%. So um, we, we uh, because we're thinking about the pension obligation bond scenario, we understand that from the city's perspective, um, the city is on the hook for making the um, interest payments on any bond that's issued, right? So the city is responsible to the plan for making contributions. And so, you know, that is an important consideration for them. And it's important information for you to understand as a plan because you're the recipient of those contributions. Part of your decision process does not have to take into account the city's obligation to meet those interest payments, but the city will take that into their calculus. And if they issue a bond that is, and we just use 2% as a number, it's likely to be higher than that. But if they issue a bond of 2%, they're going to be very keen to understand um, what is the probability that the plan will not produce returns in excess of 2%. And so if you take, if you as decision makers for the plan decide to take risk off the table, um, that increases the probability of the return not meeting or not completely covering um, the city's obligation. Again, that's not a, a, a direct variable that you should be discreetly incorporating into your decision about whether or not you want to change your risk profile, but it is good information for everyone, all of the stakeholders to understand. Conversely, if you were to increase your risk from where you're at, you certainly reduce the probability of having a return shortfall from your required rate and certainly from not achieving at least a 2% return, but then you increase that drawdown. And again, with a pension obligation bond, you're putting more money into the plan. 
So while the percentage drawdown wouldn't change, the amount of dollars that you would lose during a drawdown scenario increases. And um, Chairman Lanza made the point that an absolute larger dollar amount of loss could then translate to a higher contribution from the city. Okay, so that's how um, this particular um, uh, discussion around setting the risk target, um, as you think about the pros and cons, it's, it's about those uh, absolute dollar losses and the potential impact on the contributions. So I'm gonna pause there to see if there are any questions. Um, let me go around, Robin, on this, because uh, I'm sure there are questions. Um, Andrew, do you have any questions for Eileen? And we'll, we'll go around, Robin, and around, Rob, and then we'll open the floor. So if you want to wait to do the other questions, Andrew, that's okay. Go yeah, ahead, Andrew, not, any questions? None at the moment, thank you. Uh, Sunita, any questions? Uh, yeah, so just to make sure I understand this chart, uh, as you lower the risk profile, is the asset allocation also changing from where it is? Or is this a theoretical exercise? Uh, right now, this is theoretical. But if you change your risk profile, that um, that denotes a change to your asset allocation from where you're at today. OK. And the other question I had was, um, it's more of a mechanical question. Um, is there a way to, let's say we get $500 million of pension obligation bond money, is there a way to uh, manage that as a separate account, so to speak, where you have a different risk tolerance than the, the core portfolio? Um, you, you certainly uh, could do that. The, um, the, the issue with that is um, uh, the entire plan then um, may not derive uh, the same sort of benefit and, and how you should be thinking about the proceeds from a pension obligation bond is holistically in terms of the impact on the total plan. Because if you segregate it, then all you're focused on is that the, those proceeds. And, and remember, you are not on the hook for um, paying back, if you will, that, that um, pension obligation bond. And, and by um, investing that money differently than the rest of your plan, then you, you know, you, you're, you're kind of um, uh, um, making a decision that uh, doesn't fully reflect the benefit to the entire plan. And as fiduciaries, that's how you should be thinking about your um, uh, investment uh, decisions. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Let's assume the legality of it is, you know, Harvey and uh, I forget her name, I'm sorry. Um, the person on the call today uh, can weigh in on that. But but just sort of conceptually, uh, what I'm trying to get at is for, for the separate portfolio, your target return is whatever the funding cost of the pension obligation bond is, which is lower than the overall plan. So I don't know, I, I mean, I'd like perhaps to explore this a little more in a different meeting or a different setting, but I, maybe there is something there. So, so I think, um, you know, when we have uh, greater information around, you know, I guess number one, whether there is going to be an issuance and what the size of that is, the size of it I think is going to be a key variable in terms of you know whether it makes sense to segregate it or not. I mean, if it's small relative to the size of the entire plan, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to do that. There's going to be additional costs associated with setting up a segregated account and having separate management for it that would need to be a variable uh, that you would need to consider as well. But you know, certainly, um, you know, that shouldn't be considered off the table as you, um, as you deliberate about how to, um, you know, set your overall risk profile. And if I may, this is Maytek Chen, General Counsel for the plan. Um, you know, one thing I do want to counsel the board in a lot of the deliberations here is that the board has a duty of loyalty, first and foremost, to its members. 
And so when it's deciding whether and how to apply any POB that may be issued by the city, um, they, may, they must take into account how it affects the members and what the actual value of those assets as applied based on whatever risk profile you guys decide to use um, once we understand the size of the POB the city is considering to offer. So I just wanted to put a pin on that for the board members to chew on for now, and we can discuss at a further meeting. Thank you, Maytag. I'm so sorry. I momentarily blanked out on your name. I apologize. No, it's okay. I have a difficult name, so I don't, <laughs> I don't No, I, don't. I, do, I do too, so it's not an excuse yet. So I uh, thank you, um, Mitak, for that, um, uh, for sharing that, because I, I, I think that is a, a really key concept is um, viewing any proceeds from a pension obligation bond in terms of the entire plan and the benefit to the entire plan, as opposed to just focusing on, you know, what to do with those proceeds in, in isolation. Eileen, uh, I have a quick point, if this is okay with you. Um, on this topic, which is oh, and, and this is my colleague uh, Vance Creekpalm, who is a member of our risk group. Normally, you would be hearing from Danny, but Danny's on vacation, and Hello, Vance is his very uh, capable colleague. Yeah, so uh, no, I just wanted to mention to you because we're talking about this holistically. You know, say say theoretically that the, the assets are segregated. Um, when you look at the plan on an accounting basis or actual basis, whatever it is, you're going to look at all of them holistically. So if the expected return of the entire fund, and that is including the POB, uh, goes down, then you're effectively sort of de-risking in that sense, right? So it's like, you know, take case A, you take the POB and I'm going to target 2%, I'm going to target 3%. If that is, say, 30%, 20% of the plan assets, that's going to drag down sort of its expected return. And then, so that all have tack-on impacts, right, with contributions and everything else down the line. Not to say it's a bad idea or anything, it's just to say that, you know, uh, you can't make it that decision is not going to be able to happen sort of in a vacuum, right? It kind of trickles into all these other things. So I just want to mention that. Eileen, this is Vince. I want to um, jump in with two points here if I can. Sure. Um, sure. One, kind of following up on Sunita's comment, there is actually a paper that was published by NC PERS, their director of research, who outlined 10 different policies. And we, we actually reviewed this report at the Retirement Stakeholder Solutions Working Group. And he looked at 10 different policies that you could consider implementing to address pension funding gaps. And one of them was limited pension obligation bonds. And he specifically argued for segregating those funds if the assets were, or if the, the bond issue were 30 years to also commit that entirely to equities. And when he looked back historically over, I believe it was a 30 year period, there wasn't a single period, rolling 30 year period, where equities had underperformed the cost of the bond that had been issued during that time frame. So I just wanna make sure I point out that perspective, which is a bit in contrast to what we're, we have been previously talking about. Um, secondly, however, if, if you can go back to slide two, your chart here is fairly simplistic, and I want to make sure I'm interpreting this correctly, however, and that is if we chose, we receive pension obligation funds, we choose to reduce the risk, and the contribution were then to stay the same for the city, I'm assuming that actually the contribution would go up because the city's not only having to deal with the higher contribution due to a lower discount rate, but they now also have to service this new debt. So in fact, it would cost the city on an annual basis potentially more money by us choosing to lower the discount rate. Is your chart here factoring in that additional cost of the pension bond? So uh, this one is not, but uh, if we're ready to move forward, um, we did do some what if scenarios that actually do take that into account. So um, sh should I proceed uh, to uh, the, those scenarios or? or... Yeah, go, go ahead, Eileen, it's all pretty interactive. I think that's a good idea, go ahead. Okay. So uh, here we are on slide 10, and, and this is our sort of our first what-if scenario. So here, 
um, we were making a couple of assumptions. We're assuming that the plan would reach 100% funding in uh, 15 years. And we, at this point, had some different um, levels of the bond um, proceeds that we modeled. But I think in, in subsequent slides, we're, we're honing in more on the $500 million. But, but here, we, we looked at some different scenarios and compared them to the baseline, the baseline being the current uh, discount rate or required return of 6.65 and the current funded ratio, and this is um, a, on a market value basis of 85%. And as I mentioned earlier, um, when we are setting the risk target, we're looking at not just the required return, but we're looking at uh, variables such as the impact on the contributions, the impact on the funded ratio, and the max drawdown, the typical metrics that we focus on. So the baseline, if there was no pension obligation bond, is that very top line, the orange bar. So um, that shows you that over the next 15 years, kind of what the progression would be given the current discount rate. And then we look at some different options, but let's just focus on the $500 million option. And that is this teal colored bar, or for those of you that maybe don't have colored screens, it's the third bar from the top. And you can see the impact or the, um, the, the, the reduced contributions that would occur. And that happens because you can see the funded ratio would be expected to increase from that current 85% up to 94%. And, and the way that pension funding math works is the higher the funded rate, typically the lower the necessary um, uh, contributions. And that also would enable you to consider a, um, a lower uh, uh, required return, if you will, or discount rate of 6.4%. So if, um, and, and here we are not to, to answer your question, Mr. Sinzeri, we are not taking into account the city's debt service costs. So this is all excluding the city's expected uh, or some sort of assumption for debt service costs. This is just the plan's perspective. If it receives the proceeds, um, contributions would go down and it's uh, possible to take some risk off the table and still achieve that full funding in, in 15 years, okay? So then we go to the next slide. And what the next slide does is focuses, again, solely on that $500 million level of proceeds. And here we add an additional line, which does include an assumption for the city's debt service costs. And that is the red line, which is the second line um, from the top on the graph. So you can see um, the blue line and the baseline, those are the same lines we saw in the prior chart and the reduction in contributions. But because this is, if you will, incorporating the city's perspective, because the city has debt service costs, they actually are kind of indifferent from today with no issuance of a pension obligation bond until you get out to these much higher um, levels of either discount rate or required rate of return. So to answer your question, Trustee Sansari, if you were taking that holistic view of um, you know, what the city's total obligation is, they are essentially indifferent for issuing the pension obligation bond, including debt service, unless um, the um, returns uh, increase meaningfully from the current discount rate assumption of the 6.625. So let, let me ask my question again now and use this chart and assume the discount rate were changed from six and three quarters to six and a quarter the contribution or the cost to the city would in fact increase 
by our decision to lower the discount rate. Um, That's correct. <laughs> that is correct. Yeah. So that does sort of contradict slide two. I just want to be clear on what we were talking about earlier is that in essence, if we lowered the discount rate, um, the contribution would stay the same if we got these funds, but this is basically saying something different. I could, maybe I can jump in um, and shed some light on what exactly it is that we're trying to show. So the first slide, slide 10, its intention is to exclude the city's debt contribution situation. The, the numbers on the table on the bottom right, this discount rate of 6.4% given that you do the POV, that is under the assumption that you want to keep contributions stable from the perspective of just the money going into the pension without respect to the debt reservice payment. If that is the intention, 6.625 to 6.45, somewhere in that ballpark, is around where that discount rate makes contributions somewhat stable, so long as you know our bogey is 100% funded in 15 years. Now, if your goal is to say that, well, none of these things happen in a vacuum, the city still has to make the debt service repayment, then you move to page 11, and you'll know that if you do choose to move from 6.625% to say 6.4% or 6.25%, whatever it happens to be, the total payment out of that from the city's perspective, both to the POB as well as to the pension is going to go up. Uh, the amount that it goes up, I don't know, you can kind of, uh, I'll have to do a little bit of quick visual math here, something to the tune of maybe 100 million, 75 million, somewhere around there. Um, but I wouldn't say they necessarily contradict, they're simply showing different things. I mean, the intention of this slide is to say, look at it holistically, more so from the city's general kind of 100 degree view perspective. The slide before this is just kind of, you know, look at it, you know, on your own straight and narrow. So I'll pause here. Uh, can I just uh, ask a question? What is the assumption here in terms of the cost of the pension obligation bond, the interest rate on that? Yes, uh, maybe Eileen, can you take us to page 14? Because <laughs> that has the POB assumptions in it. Yeah, so here we go. Uh, this was copied from or taken from Bill's presentation earlier, so I tried to match them up. Uh, although I don't know, I think you might have used a 3% versus 3.5, I forget exactly which, which it was, but this assumes a 3.5% interest rate, 2.25% increase in that payment, I think because it's lining up with the sort of the amortization policy of the pension itself. And then it assumes a $1 billion uh, POB, where 500 million of which is given to the pension. So the amounts that you're being display that are being displayed on slide 11 is half of these amounts. Because uh, this includes the total amount, but you know, obviously, if they split the proceeds equally, you know, half of say 80 million, 40 million is going to be sort of paid for by the uh, police and fire system, and that's what's being included in slide 11. So hopefully I answered your question. Yeah, okay. And uh, the thing I would say is, uh, you know, I, I echo what Vince said um, in terms of the long-term returns and how you would deal with it, you know, if you issued a bond. And uh, I think, and, and the question in terms of a drawdown, you know, which is, I guess, the fear that people have, right? You just put in an extra 500 million, let's say, um, into these risk assets, and then you get a big drawdown. Um, I would say that the approach should be to look at these returns over a longer period of time. And to the extent that we are looking at, you know, considering the current risk profile, the 6.625 or a lower risk profile is to say, is there a, you know, a period, a 10 year period of 15 or, or 20, you know, whatever the, the bond duration is, when there is a benefit, uh, to taking that lower risk profile. Um, my, my intuitively, I would say no, and I should, we should not change anything. Um, just take, you know, just put uh, the extra money in and allocate it just like we have. Um, but that would be, uh, you know, kind of the way I would look at it to see, is there a longer duration when there is a benefit to taking that, that lower risk? Um, and uh, intuitively, I would say history says probably not. So it might be helpful to um, spend just a minute on slide 12. And here, what we're doing is we are making the assumption that the plan doesn't change 
its risk profile. So that means the expected return of the current asset allocation is somewhere in the ballpark of the discount rate. So, um, you know, the, the, again, if we we're, we're showing that same uh, $500 million uh, investment of proceeds in the total asset allocation, and then we include um, uh, a line which shows the um, contribution, including the debt reservice payment. And, um, you know, what, what we do know is that, you know, for the next 10 years or so, based on Makita's assumptions, the expected return is roughly 5.9%. So that's actually lower than the 6.625 if we just focus on that 10 year period. Um, and, and, and there, um, you know, what, what the benefit is from maintaining the 6.625 is you're discounting your liabilities at a higher rate. So you actually have a better buffer, if you will, from maintaining that higher discount rate assumption and your contributions don't change as much because you're discounting that liability at that higher rate. Um, so, so that is one of the benefits and it's not, um, not unmeaningful of maintaining the current discount rate assumption. Now we know that over that longer term period of 20 years, um, under the Makita assumptions, the, um, the strategic asset allocation should provide a return in excess of the 6.625. And um, obviously then that helps with uh, both future contributions um, as well as um, providing higher growth, organic growth to those assets. So your, your contributions don't decline as much under that higher growth rate or discount rate scenario. And that's one of the other considerations that um, you should keep in mind. Uh, in, in this decision. So Eileen, just one more question. So as you look at the city's uh, net cash flow, which is contributions minus debt ser service, right? Mm -hmm. uh, are you including uh, an amortization component, which is the principal repayment? I don't think we did. Uh, and Vance, I'll ask you, but I, I don't uh, think we did. I think it was more so the, the payment amounts on, so okay. So like page 14, I guess maybe we should look at that because we're talking about the bond stuff. Uh, all of these bars, if you sum them up, will be both the interest as well as the principal uh, necessary oh. to pay off the $1 billion bond. So if you sum up these lines, they're all roughly just under $100 million, 100 million yeah. times. And I would say that at least to the extent that, uh, you know, the way you look at real estate is that principal repayment actually is, you know, is is a return for the city because you know, you're paying back and you don't owe on the bond anymore. So maybe that component, uh, you know, while it is a drag in terms of the yearly outflow, um, is a benefit in the long term because you know, at the end of that period, you know, you've repaid the bond. Yeah, although that is the benefit to the city and I think to the point that Maytac made mm -hmm. earlier that, that that shouldn't, theoretically discreetly factor into yeah. the decision. I think the point that we make here on slide 12 is, is more relevant in that, you know, it does um, support the um, maintenance of higher growth by having your liabilities discounted at a um, higher rate. Okay. Yeah, and just to piggyback a little bit on um, Eileen's point, you know, the contributions are set on the actuarial value of the app. So that's one thing to keep in mind, not the market value of the assets. So just because we get a sudden influx and we have a return that one year doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to use a market value to set the contribution rates. Got it. Thank you. I just jump on a little bit here. Um, so, I mean, this kind of sort of grounding us back to our roles as trustees of this, this fund. Um, so, you know, the objective in this analysis that you set was to achieve the funding ratio of 100%. So the, out, the output from that is what the 
contribute and, and then there's another input which is basically what is what is a comfortable risk profile for this fund but the output is the contribution of the city so we should be agnostic to that if the output means the contribution increases it's more of informing the city or i'm sort of confirming my understanding that this could this would happen if this is the goal is is that correct am i understanding this correctly from a legal standpoint or a fiduciary standpoint Correct. From the fiduciary standpoint, your duty is first and foremost is a duty of loyalty to the members. And to do that, you have to ensure the competency of the assets in the system. And to do that, you have to then decide any sort of contributions from the city based on the actuarial value of the assets. And so just because we get a sudden influx, our number one primary decision in terms of allocating any of the assets, should we get the bond money? is not to determine what the, in any way lower the city's contributions. That should not be our primary concern. Our primary concern should be the competency of the assets as a long-term issue so that we can deliver benefits to all our members. And so I just want to reframe the discussion a little bit just so, from the fiduciary and legal standpoint for the board members. That's helpful, thank you. Let me just challenge that Maytag very, very briefly and you'll know exactly where I'm going. And you, I think you said that right. Maytag said that's our primary. Unfortunately, there's an easy answer. We just take all the money and stuff it under a mattress and take no risk at all. And that guarantees we'll be able to pay it. But of course, it's not quite that simple because if we stuff it all under a mattress, the city will go bankrupt. And so we get into these secondary and tertiary effects. And so our loyalty to our members is... is Absolute, but we have to be careful that we don't kill the goose that's paying out those benefits. Am I correct there, Maytech? There's a there's secondary and tertiary effects which we try to not get into, right? Correct. So there, as a party of our duty of loyalty, so we have a duty of loyalty to both the retired members and the active members. And so one of the issues that we may run into if the financial burden in the city is so great and they're facing a layoff, for example, of all as active members, we do part of our duty of loyalty, for example, would be if there was a concern from the city, if we have to pay this contribution, we'll have to lay off, you know, a number of your active members that would be a consideration that would satisfy our duty of loyalty in deciding whether and how much to lower um, the employer's contributions and how to apply whatever bond money that comes in. So we have to take a look at it holistically, including, you know, because this fund is intergenerational, so to speak, and to make sure the longevity of the fund is financially sound. Right, and you could, for my fellow trustees who aren't super familiar with fiduciary duties, you can square that circle because you have two primary fiduciary duties and may tax off on duty of loyalty because you also have the, the preeminent one, which is the duty of care, the so-called prudent person rule. And a prudent person would not take four, $5 billion and stuff them under a mattress. A prudent person would say, there's some amount of risk which makes sense. And I think that's at the core of this debate. Would you agree with that too, Maytag? Yes, I would. So well, however you decide to take the money, it wouldn't be prudent, like uh, Drew said, to stuff it under the mattress. You would have to then decide how would you best get returns on the money from a long, long-term long perspective. And to just actually, so I can build off, the, the reason why the duty of loyalty to the active members and the layoffs is that from the fund's perspective, you guys collect employee contributions. So if there was a massive layoff, you wouldn't be able to collect those employee contributions that would then in turn affect the uh, you know financial soundness of the plan going forward. So it's a very complicated and complex duty of loyalty. And I think a lot of it is hard to discuss in a vacuum right here from a legal perspective, because A, we don't know what the bond amount is. B, we don't know if there's any sort of earmarked on the bond. And C, you know, we don't know what our options are um, considering the size of the bond that may affect how we decide to reallocate our risk um, profiles. So I did just want to flag the fiduciary duties, but I don't think we're at a mature point to fully discuss them in a um, detailed fashion. Thank you. Hey, Drew, this is Franco. I've got a comment and I guess kind of a question. Sure. Um, one, and you guys know me, I'm always up at the 50,000 foot mark. I, I just want to remind you that if we take this money and it temporarily lowers the city's contribution, they're obviously going to have a contribution that's going to come back later, depending on how returns are on it. 
but that also affects payroll, it affects everything, right? And we've always talked about that. My other comment is this, considering that this conversation started when we were at a 70% level, now that we're looking at something different, and this is maybe for Pam, is the council still gonna have serious interest in this? Because we're, we're looking a little bit different, you know, uh, the difference a year makes. So I, I guess that's kind of my question. And I also wanna point out that when we lower the discount rate, Remember, the normal cost is going to go up for the city and the members as well. If, if that's a question for me, I don't have an answer yet. It, it, until we get uh, certified for the pension obligation bonds and, and the risk and further analysis, I don't know how the council is going to feel about it one way or the other. I know that's not helpful. Uh, floor is still open. Anybody else wants to jump in? Yeah, Drew, Dick Santa. Good, Dick. Yeah, just just a few comments. You know, I, I was uh, there when, when the city council was given this uh, investment presentation, and uh, it was helpful to listen and, and was trying to, to learn all the uh, pros and cons. Now, they believe Bill gave us a presentation here some time ago, and I had a little more handle on it. And today is very helpful because of our staff and our board members chiming in. Um, but for me, the jury is still out on this because I have a question uh, or a comment that maybe we can take a look at. Years ago, when I was an employee, the city manager then was Gerald Newfarmer, and there was a $60 million bond loss. So I'd like to I don't know if this was related, but I think we should take a look at that so we don't make mistakes again or find out if this is a different process. And then when it's all said and done, it sounds like to me, we took a couple hundred dollars a month cash and played the lotto, we'd have a better chance. Uh, all this stuff so far, to me, the jury is still out, but I sure appreciate Eileen and the staff, you know, making this presentation. The more I hear from my colleagues, the more I can learn but the jury is still out. Uh, I still don't see the a big advantage. Uh, so thank you. Uh, floor is still open. Anybody has any questions? Hi, I drew. Uh, this is uh, this is Howard. Um, I, I this is super useful, um, and I think Sunita and Vince bring up a lot of good points about. Um, you know how we should how we should look at this and what the, what the numbers mean in terms of uh, you know the actual contributions and the impacts. But going forward, it seems like you know as indicated earlier in the presentation, or at least what Nikita said, we're, we're missing a lot of information about you know it's not in our control. But what if the size were different? What if it's not 500 million? What if it's a billion? And also the structure. And then going forward. These discussions are useful, but we always have to ask the two questions, right? Is it, you know, what's the impact on the city? What's the impact for our members? And we, and I, I'd like to sort of have a framework of how we could look at this data and then be able to say, okay, you know, in this case, it's clear the city contribution something or the employer employee contribution. I'd like to be able to do that simultaneously, maybe without having to flip charts. And so that way, uh, maybe we can get to an efficient way of looking at this as, as time goes on. So my hope is, and I brought us back to slide two, that, that that's what this framework that, you know, we really wanted to introduce, um, you know, enables you to do because um, the, the main two um, metrics, if you will, that are relevant as you are setting your asset allocation objective and your risk target are, um, you know, what what that return means in terms of your ability to achieve your objective, which is funding those benefit payment obligations, and what that might mean in terms of the impact on contributions and how contributions might change. So, you know, between these two um, slides and focusing on those metrics and including the incorporation of 
um, uh, tail events, if you will, to make um, to, to draw a holistic picture of the ramifications of the important decisions you make, which is primarily setting the asset allocation and risk targets. Hey, Aline, uh, if I may, if you could take my comment in the right spirit on page two, I think the confusing part about this is there are two different uh, sort of dis decision bodies here. One is us as board tr trustees, and we determine the discount rate based on our obligation. And then there is the city that determines the contributions. I know, or has to meet the contributions based on the output of this model. So in many ways, that part of it is it, not a decision for us, the, the contributions. Well well, the discount rate actually directly affects the contributions or the normal cost, right? Because- True, um, but it's not, a, it's not an input in our process. It's an output of our process. Correct. But I, I think the relevance of it is, um, you know, just like you don't just look at your asset volatility um, in terms of making the uh, asset allocation uh, policy decision and the discount rate decision. Decision. Um, you you need broader information of the fall on effects, if you will, of that single decision. Because um, you know, I think the point made earlier about well, if if in fact, let's just say, well, we want to take risk off, and 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 um, you know, you take risk off meaningfully, and that causes contributions to increase to the point where the city feels they need to make, um, uh, uh, take actions such as laying off uh, employees or what have you, um, as a result of that, that's an important input because that is point. part of your fiduciary decision. Yeah, fair point, except it, yeah. Um, any other questions? or I'll jump in and Peru's going to give us the wrap up. So let's let's reframe this again. I think I think what you said was was really smart Howard. So Vince told us something that's really really important. If I understood you right Vince, what you said was say this is a 30-year bond and say we take the money and stick it in a very broad basket of stocks. If I understood what you said right Vince, over no 30-year period, probably since the Great Depression, has a large diversified basket of stocks not returned some absolute return number, right? That's what you're saying, right, Vince? It's always been right. positive, right? And so if that number, let's say the city, let's just say, can issue a pension obligation bond at 3%, well, if that number historically is greater than 3%, then this is an absolute no-brainer asterisk okay asterisk that's assuming the future is like the past but of course that may not be true and we've certainly seen that with inflation which over the last 20 years has done something it's never really done in history probably due to central banks and, and internets and stuff like that so the issue is not there are two issues here right the issue is well what's going to happen with our expected right rate of return and we can spit that number out and it'll be great news, right? Because I expect we're returning six something percent and the city's paying out 3%. And that's an arbitrage you take all day, every day of the bank. It's not really an arbitrage, I get it, but what the heck? So the question is, which is how we got here in the first place. Okay, what happens when Murphy, Mr. Murphy's Law pays us a visit? And that's Eileen's chart. What happens when we get the straw down? And that is how we pick that red bar is how we picked our asset allocation and therefore our discount rate. We are running our system, not based on six point something percent woohoo. We're running our system based on surviving this drawdown, right? And so at some level, this is easy. A bigger fund, because we took a mention obligation bonds, will generate a bigger drawdown. Right. But of course, it's not quite that complicated as everybody keeps saying, yeah, but our funds doing a little better off. So maybe we can tolerate a slightly bigger drawdown. But if I so so the long story short, I'll answer the question is right. A 25% drawdown on a four billion dollar fund is a billion dollar hole. 
right? A 20% drawdown on a $5 billion fund is a billion dollar hole. So if the city said, I'm gonna give you a billion dollars extra in pension obligation bonds to your $4 billion fund, and I applied the same logic that you guys at, Vera, at Veris gave us three or four years ago, I would write, just go up this chart in the right-hand column from 25% to 20%, right? And then generate an asset allocation. Now that would tell me, right, with that asset allocation in the shock that caused a, a billion dollar loss in a $4 billion portfolio, this will now cause a billion dollar loss in a $5 billion portfolio. Am I right? Do you know what I, you get what I just said? That's right. So Varys is telling us, guys, we, we kind of have all the information you need um, to figure this out. So my, and I'll turn to you, so my guess is, Eileen, you've taken us, and, and Chiron, you've built taking over 80 or 90% of the way there. Now, forgetting what Vince said, because Vince said, okay, Drew, maybe, maybe we should do this differently. If we said the game we're going to play is to take in the money, right, and think through how we'll deal with this drawdown risk, we have enough, Eileen, we, you and, and staff and Bill could go away and give us some what-if scenario tables, of, right, Vance, like you were saying, let me do some quick visual math. We could concretely say, at this discount rate, at this amount of extra pension obligation bond, right, for this volatility, here's what the annual city contribution will be, right? And that's probably what we give the city is tables. Hey, city, you go figure it out. I think, to some extent, the information we need to give the city, and Maytag has led us to this, is city, if you give us money in a certain amount, what ifs, we will dial back our discount rate. Volatility sets asset allocation, asset allocation sets discount rate. And oh, by the way, City, these tables are based on, on this slide that Eileen's got right in front of you here. Am I in the right general vicinity board, Eileen, Bill, and Prabhu's gonna give us a wrap up. Is that kind of what, what you're thinking, Eileen? So, Yes, I think in terms of a decision framework, this is the type of information that we would work with Chiron and Makita to once we have, you know, sort of more meat on the bones about whatever this bond size may be and the tenor and so forth, then yes, you would have, um, you know, enough of the raw inputs to make assessments about whether or not you should um, change your risk profile and also the discount rate. And then that information could be provided to the city and, um, and, and we can you know, probably even work with you know, some questions or data that the city may want to see sensitivity around um, in conjunction with the investment program. So yes. And is it your instinct, Eileen, that a 100% funded plan, shh, certainly 100% funded plan can take on more risk, more volatility. Is it your sense, Eileen, that a 100% plan should take on a little more risk than, a, say, a 70% funded plan? So it's a very good question, and, and and the way that you think about the response differs based upon the type of investor. So um, a public fund approach, it would be different than a private pension plan approach. And if we just focus on the public plan approach, you would need to get to pretty much full funding to sort of revisit that question. Because at some point beyond full funding, you actually should take risk off the table and probably in a meaningful way. But you actually have to already be at full funding and beyond it to some degree, just the way, again, the, the pension math, the funding math, and so forth works. So yes, at some point, it makes sense to take risk off the table, but there is nothing within this 15-year time horizon, because you won't be, you're not expected to be fully funded, does that um, discussion really uh, factor into the equation? That's Drew, this is... I mean, the final comment, then I'll, I'll turn it to you guys. So. 
Thanks a lot. Eileen just pointed out that way over in the side of the control room, there's a panel with a locked key that says, open me when you get to 100% funding. And you open it, it's got 10 more knobs in it. Sorry, go ahead, jump in, whoever wants to jump in. No, I was just going to say to you, which was a very good question. I know. Uh, from an actual standpoint, uh, Bill may have some comments and also Prabhu from the investment standpoint from the plan. But just say, as a matter of history, um, what happened 20 years ago, two of our peer plans in California did reach a 100% funded ratio or higher. Now, taking it aside the fact that benefits were increased, right, which, which actually increases the liability of the plan, um, I think you could argue that many of those plans that were 100% funded did not take risk off the table. And you saw what happened with the two downturns that happened in the last decade, right? And that's where all this issue um, has come about the last 20 years, clearly compounded by the increase in benefits uh, um, for, the, uh, for the employees, right? That said, wow. had an input. But I think to... to you do get to a meaningful 100% funding ratio on a natural day. Time we ever get to that point, when I say we, I mean the general we peers, public plans, California, hopefully can draw from the experience in 2000 or the first decade of this century that, you know, Drew, I just want to point out that we have not seen um, the report from Makita, our general consultant. Um, it was at the very beginning of the presentation. Yeah. And we skipped over it, so I don't want to dismiss. No. Well, I didn't see. It, I didn't see. Did you see, um, I didn't see anybody from Akita on, Vince. Did you, are they on? I looked. Yeah. Yeah, Laura is on. Oh, Laura, you're on? Sorry, I must have missed you before. Yeah, Laura, do you want to go ahead and loop that in before um, we ask more questions and then Prabhu wrap up? Uh, this is Jared from Makita. I think Laura had to step away for a second, um, but I can share my screen and the presentation that we have. Yeah, go ahead. And uh, actually, Prabhu, as Laura stepped out, I know you helped spearhead a lot of this. Um, do you want to uh, kind of start this off or say anything in particular, or else I can just highlight some of the things that I know uh, Laura wanted to, to talk about? Yeah, Jared, why don't you skip slide two and three, because that's going to be part of my wrap up, and then you can go on to slide four. Okay. Um, yeah, and if you wouldn't mind uh, helping me with this uh, a little bit as you can, but I think, um, you know, in general, we're just trying to look at a couple of different ways to think about the risk level um, if there was a cash infusion. So this is just a hypothetical example of 500 million coming in, how that changes the city's contribution on a percentage level. Um, and there at the bottom, kind of the equivalent um, kind of risk level and actuarial sum rate of return being the same um, in this situation. Um, another point would be here on this page is to look at it as what if the assets were invested into long-term credit. So you see here on the right side of this table, at the very bottom, long-term credit goes from zero currently to 10%. Um, long-term credit being relevant here because that would be the expected return generation similar to the cost of the POV. Um, and you can see some other parts moved around there in the asset allocation, but ultimately you see that at the very bottom that the 20 year expected return goes down to 6.5 uh, from 6.8. And in particular, I think what Laura wanted to highlight is here at the top section of this, of this last page of our uh, presentation was just to consider that that means that most likely um, over the long term the uh, peer relative results are likely to be worse. And while uh, some people would understand that and the risk level um, that generated that result with markets going up more often than they go down, that's a likely result of a long period. And just to, uh, I guess, consider how that would be viewed 
uh, just in terms of pure relative performance ranking over time with a more conservative uh, allocation. Um, and the bottom bullet point here is something we've talked about a little bit already, just if the assets are segregated into a separate sleeve, uh, you lose a little bit of the leverage uh, to negotiate fees on that. So potentially that, that bucket might have higher fees than otherwise. Um, at the same time, a large contribution by having a more conserved vast allocation and being more in long-term bonds, assuming some of that is coming out of equities, total portfolio fees would decrease um, in that standpoint. So um, probably, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to what I've, I've said or, or um, if you want me to back up to page two. No, that, that's exactly right, Jared. I think that's what Laura wanted to communicate is the impact on returns relative to peers if we lower our risk and also the impact on fees, which are very practical considerations uh, for this plan. Uh, but, but, but Drew, uh, I don't know if others have questions. I've been writing down notes. Uh, I know Pra Prabhu wants to wants to take us home with the wrap up. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I think I would be interested. Um, I, I I thought during this discussion we had maybe two viewpoints. I thought Drew was pushing for you know you take the bonds and lower the risk profile, and I thought Vince and I were suggesting that we don't change the risk profile because the long term. Uh, you're better off, um, you know, just staying with, because, you know, risk assets, as long as you keep it for a long enough time, seem to do better, right? Um, Prabhu, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that. Um, yeah, yeah. So as part of my summary comments, I will touch on that. Uh, so thank you, Drew. Uh, firstly, you know, if I haven't said this before, I love this board. Uh, very few boards will be disengaged on, on a topic so dense. So let me reiterate that. And, and Drew actually framed the question brilliantly at the beginning of the discussion as he has done for, for a few years now. And, and he actually guided Veris. Uh, so a lot of credit to Eileen, but a lot of credit to Drew in actually coming up with those slides. Um, but let's, let's put this discussion in some context, right? Firstly, uh, as council member Foley pointed out, you know, we don't know what the city council is going to do. We don't know if it's going to be 500 million or 200 million or 100 million. And even if they do issue bonds, we don't know if the police and fire plan is going to be a beneficiary of this because there's certainly more bang for the buck to put this in the federated plan than the police and fire plan. But Drew has pointed out that just because we don't have that information doesn't mean we shouldn't be ready. And, and that's why we're doing this exercise, right? But let's put this in context. We don't know the size. And I think Franco pointed this out, is when we had the retirement working group, we did not expect a return of 25% in one year, right? And so we've actually, we are richer by a billion dollars. So that puts less pressure on the council and other stakeholders to actually issue a large bond, right? In terms of um, writing down our UAL. So that's something to keep in mind. And a lot of the discussion was around the cost of funding of the bond, right? And because a lot of us are investors, right? Vince, Ishwar, Sunita, I thought the same way. I was thinking, what's the cost of the bond? Can I get a risk-free arbitrage? If it's going to cost the city 2% and I can put it in a corporate bond that's 4%, then you know, we're all well off, right? If I can match duration and I say, look, here's a risk-free arbitrage, we're all going to be wealthier. But our sponsor has repeatedly told us uh, that don't worry about our cost. That's our business, right? You, you guys worry about what you should do for your pensioners. Don't worry about our cost. And we'll get, we'll get a chance to challenge that when our sponsor actually you know, presents, I, I believe the finance director is going to present their views to the board, correct me if I'm wrong, Roberto, in September. Uh, that is correct. And we will also get a chance to, to put the city council on the spot at the joint council boards meeting in terms of you know, their risk capacity and risk level. As Drew pointed out, and, and Maytag clarified this, this is a complex issue, right? It's our fiduciary duty is to our pensioners, but also there are intergenerational equity issues. So we should also be thinking about our sponsor. So in my, in my mind, and, and, and Ishwar just 
again, reiterated this, right? Should we be lowering our risk or increasing our risk? In my mind, there's, there's two dif distinct dis decisions, right? Do we want to lower the discount rate or not? And as Franco rightly pointed out, that has a lot of implications. What are the contributions going to be from our sponsor? It's also going to impact our employees and their paychecks, right? And then there's the decision on asset allocation. And the two don't necessarily have to be tied together all the time, right? And that's the question that Ishwar and Vince have brought up. How should we actually manage our assets, right? And look, unless the city is going to give us, they're going to completely write down the UAL and make it zero, and we're going to be 100% funded. And I don't think that's going to be the case. We don't need to worry too much about that part of it. I think we can still hold our asset allocation pretty steady and not worry too much about that. But we can still have this other knob of what do we do with the discount rate, right? And so I think, look, risk is, and this is an, on slide one, I was trying to say is, you know, it can be a linear function. I don't, I don't want to overcomplicate this, but when we think of risk tolerance, we can actually calibrate it in such a fine way that for every additional dollar, we can change our risk level. But Risk is also behavioral, it's very elusive. So it's very hard to say within a band whether we should change risk or not. So the argument I guess I'm making indirectly is that unless there's a huge infusion of capital, and I don't think it's going to be more than our investment returns, it's going to be some part of it. We don't really need to tamper our asset allocation too much, right? Now, on the other hand, there's some academic evidence that Vince has pointed out that you know you could you could put it all in equities, and I would say, yeah, you could do that if it's a if it's a hundred million contribution by way of POB, you can say, yeah, take our most risky asset class and put it in there and forget about it, right? Because over the long run, it's going to do extremely well. But if it's going to be somewhere in between, it's not going to be a billion plus dollars. It's not going to be a hundred million dollars. If it's going to be something more like our annual contribution, then I would say, yeah, you know, keep keep our asset allocation st steady. I don't think it's going to impact. Um, things too much. And in the long run, I think we'll be better off because despite having a great year in the past 12 months, this is only going to lower our capital market assumptions, which means going forward, in order to get those same six and five, eight returns, we actually have to increase our risk from an asset allocation point of view, right? So that's something to bear in mind. But we still can play around with that discount rate. And there are many factors that go into it. And I'm sure we'll discuss that. Um, to, so to summarize, what I want to say is, I think we can sort of make this a little simpler. And you know, when we think about our asset allocation separately from our discount rate, and we will get more information from the city as we as we engage with them, and we we'll, we we'll, you know we can come up with uh, with an actual recommendation. And the IC chair has also kindly allowed us to, you know, continue this discussion in two weeks at the at the investment committee meeting, where I think we can all uh, talk some more on this topic. Uh, but for now, I think we are going to hear from our sponsor in September. We are going to we are we do have a joint city council board meeting. I think we have information, as as Drew said, it's not that complicated. Uh, you know, Veris can go back. And you know it's a multi-dimensional problem. We can we can assume various risk levels, and we can show our sponsor the impact of holding constant certain things and changing certain knobs. And so that's an exercise that Veris can easily do, and that's the kind of information that we can provide our sponsor. We can provide our city council and say, look, here's the implication of what you're trying to do, and now that you have this information, what do you feel? And try to get more information from them. Uh, with that, I'll I'll finish my comments. I'll end my comments. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, Drew. Happy to take questions. And uh, any final questions? I I think this is complicated. We're in a, this train control room is massive, right? And we're just even now after Vince and I being on for ten years, as Eileen says, discovering new boxes every day. So, any final thoughts or comments, anybody? Yeah, I right, it was a really good discussion. Oh. Excellent. Go, go to Sunita first and Vince second. Sorry. Um, I, I said I think it was an extremely good discussion. I certainly, I, I feel like it's finally crystallizing. I really appreciated Prabhu's comments in the end that, you know, if you're, if the closer we are to the 100% funding, then the, the asset allocation discussion becomes meaningful. 
Uh, and I, I think that's the messaging to the city that if you're going to give us a billion dollars, we might need to, need to change our risk profile because we'd be at 100% roughly. But if you're not giving us a billion dollars, this is not a discussion for now. This is our annual process. That's sort of what I'm taking away, and, and I appreciate the simplicity of that. Uh, go ahead, Vince. Uh, I, I just I, I want to tread carefully on this, given what Maytech has advised. But I, I do think that this is really important statements to consider, given our fiduciary duty. Four of us on this board or our CIO and CEO were part of the retirement stakeholder solutions working group. And when we were talking about pension obligation bonds, it actually started pre-pandemic and concluded shortly after the economy was just starting to reopen. Um, views, I think, are going to be valuable for us to express to city council, and particularly having our council liaison here that might be able to share these views. A, a couple important facts. Number one, Prabhu has pointed out a billion dollars, a return of 26% plus is greater than any fiscal year going back decades. And now for us to consider how we might invest, we don't know how much, potentially $500 million is actually a pretty challenging position to put our board in and may actually not be one of the most appealing positions to put our board in given the recovery that we've seen in financial markets. It was a much easier discussion at the Retirement Stakeholder Solutions Group prior to the downturn, prior to these big returns. It might influence the thinking going forward. Thanks, Vince. There was a third voice in there. Somebody else wanted to comment? Yeah, Drew, it's, uh, it's, it's Franco. I, I, I just want to point out last thing, and, and, and I get this. We can't control what the city council does or doesn't do. That's, that's obvious. But I think this board could make a recommendation to whether we need the money or not. And I think we have to at least consider that. I frame, frame that up for me, Franco. What, what do you think we should be debating or considering? Well, I understand, but we're, our, our conversation is around, well, when we get the money or if we get the money, we've got to invest it differently because the, it's got a different rate and all these complicated things. But the reality of the situation, by the time this would go to the voters, what if we have another year like this year? What if we get another 20 or 25 percent? Do we need the money? Do we need to put that obligation on the city? Oh, Frank, you just pointed out more control knobs than damn control. <laughs> well, to frame up Frank is saying it'd be interesting. Might be the case where all of a sudden in a year or two, we're more than 100% funded. And then we kick into what Harvey is talking about, which is can we immunize the retirement? If the retirement system is 105% funded, Harvey will jump up and down and say, immunize, immunize, guarantee that you never have to worry about it again. And that's a whole different ball, like so. That's a really good point. The future. I mean, the whole point of this thing, right, Frank, is the future is unknown, and we keep talking about downturns, but we're not talking about upturns, as you point out. Anybody else yeah. want to jump in? I, I would add, Mr. Chairman, if I can add to what Frank has said. I would, I would, if I were the sponsor, to his point, I would go and get permission to issue the bonds, but then wait and see what happens in the market. And that can also always be done. And you don't have to issue the bonds. Oh, that's a good point. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yeah, that, Drew, this is uh, Howard. I, yeah, I want to sort of follow what uh, Franco and Prabhu and everyone else has said. You know, from the point of view of the city, uh, I think they should, along with um, Councilwoman Pam, if, if they don't um, understand the implications of what they do, I think that'll be... Um, an error on their part. So I think it's our obligation, maybe it's a recommendation, maybe it's education to, to make sure they understand with their eyes wide open what, what could happen, uh, what might happen, but it's not our, it's not our um, role to tell them what to do, obviously. 
Yeah, I agree, Howard. That, that's why in the beginning, I remember I said in that analogy, there's a great big screen in the middle. And the first number is annual city contribution. I agree. I think in a way, we need, and, and Eileen, you guys have very much done a great job, and so has Katie. We need to boil this down to a really simple table. Say, and a little footnote that says, you're in a control room with 100 knobs, but here's the big message. You know, I agree 100%. I mean, I, I, you, I'm in the thick of this along with Prabhu and, and Roberto and Eileen. I can barely wrap my hands around it. This is tricky stuff. Anybody else? Any other comments? Drew, just a quick comment. Uh, I think along the lines of Prabhu, this is a very complicated matter. Um, again, I, I can't emphasize enough this is ultimately a decision by the city. Um, I think um, you board can certainly share your views and provide some data at the joint meeting. In other words, more food for thought for the city, but ultimately the city has to rely on the consultants and the staff to decide how, if at all, they're going to move forward. And you know, it's a very complicated matter. I, I, but for the same token, I don't want to overcomplicate it any more than Let's face it. I mean, a lot of this have to do with timing. Have the board, have the city board issue a POB last in the spring of 2020? They could have not been happier today, right? That didn't oh, yeah. happen. And now, you know, we'll see what what the future holds. Uh, I think Prabhu is correct. They could wait to see what happens. On the other hand, you know, um, you just you are the uh, the wind for the market and hopefully if they do decide to move forward and they uh, flow the bonds uh, you know we hope that we will make the board will make the decisions in terms of how to invest those bonds but at the end of the day um, regardless of what the decision is in terms of the allocation we are going to uh, be at the mercy of the market so uh, again this is a decision by the city um, we don't have to worry about that. We can share data and provide input, but ultimately it's for the city to decide. Oh. Thank you. Drew, if I could. Uh, uh, yeah, Pam, jump in. Yeah, I just wanted to say we've had actually a lot of, at the council level, uh, one, maybe two study sessions on this topic, and we get briefed on it quite extensively every time the subject of uh, pension obligation bonds comes up. We've authorized staff to move forward getting the approval so that we could issue the bonds if and when we want to, but that's really a big if because as you've mentioned, the timing is really, really critical. So we haven't said, yes, we're going to issue the bonds because we don't have approval to do so yet. Then that's a long process. There's a lot of legal work involved, and that's what we're moving forward with right now. But I would suggest that your views, your advice, and your data would be really helpful to me as a council member, and I'm sure all the other council members would appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome, Pam. Yeah, I, I think the con I talk Harvey and I talked about it. The context in which I see this is our friendly neighborhood, Pam, reaching over and saying, hey, you guys are kind of the experts in this. Would you help us do the analysis? And I think that's a very fair ask. And so I think what we need to spit back, and this is Maytag's point, is, look, here's data to make your decision, and we're trying our, our, our hardest not to bias your decision. Any other questions? But frankly, I think that bias is okay. You're fiduciaries of the fund, right? Uh, so I don't, I don't object to a biased opinion from you. I, I want to hear your honest opinion, and I don't consider that biased. I consider you looking at it as a fiduciary, which is your job. Uh, well, that, that, that's fair. I guess I, I mean unbiased in the sense that this is all about predicting the future and who the hell wants to be in that business <laughs> that's it that's exactly right drew i mean i understand where uh council member foley is coming from and i'm all for i mean this is a team right and we want to make sure that we share our views and the board share our views and the data with the city council because we certainly want to make sure that when the decision is reached is based on information that is accurate so they can make the best decision. But I think to Drew's point, this is about, about really guessing the future 
I would never want the board to be in a position where, you know, the city decides not to go a specific route based on the board's input, and then they come back a year later, gee, there was another 30-year, 30, 30 percent return, and you told us not to do things. Uh, what are we going to do now, right? We never want to be in that position. So I think we should be very open. We should be very transparent. We should be providing as much data and food for thought as possible, always understanding this is ultimately a decision by the city council. Great, great way to wrap up that that session. Um, let's keep going, Roberto. Um, over to you on um, 4E on a disability. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So you may recall that uh, staff was uh, working on uh, an RFP that was issued uh, for your board medical advisor. And that uh, staff group was led by our deputy director, uh, Barbara Heyman. And uh, we also mentioned to you at the last meeting in June that uh, we were wrapping up the process and that we were gonna be ready at your August meeting uh, with uh, a recommendation. I trust that you had a chance to read the recommendation by staff with the information. And so with that, I'll just turn it over to Barbara for her presentation. Good morning, Barbara. Oh, I should say good afternoon now. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto. Yes, yeah, so this uh, this memo requ is requested for the CEO to negotiate and execute an agreement with uh, Work Health Solutions to provide disability medical evaluation services for an amount not to exceed 250,000 for fiscal year 2021-22 uh, with two one-year extension options to extend beyond uh, June 30th, 2022. So um, earlier this year, uh, the board medical advisor, Dr. Susan Tierman, who had previously provided disability medical evaluation services, announced that she was retiring. And staff um, then issued uh, an RFP seeking uh, a new board medical advisor to provide disability medical evaluation services. Uh, we had three vendors respond to the RFP, uh, Managed Medical Review Organization, Work Care, and Work Health uh, Solutions. Um, the RFP, the services requested, uh, included assessing the medical information regarding each applicant's claim for disability, identifying the medical speciality needed for the medical examination, um, and now the doctor that will actually conduct the applicant's medical examination will be a physician from the board's existing IME vendors, um, and that's ExamWorks and Medlink. Uh, services requested also included uh, reviewing the IMA report and writing an independent report for the board, um, as well as attending you know, all the, the board meetings, um, and also uh, providing supplemental medical reports an expert test when needed. Uh, the RFP committee in included Dr. Tierman. Uh, we assessed the three proposals and conducted interviews uh, for each of them. Uh, MMRO, um, they, during the interviews, it was, it was um, evident they didn't really fully understand the role of the disability medical evaluator. Uh, most of their written proposal was focused on the work of um, you know, IME and administrative work. Uh, they didn't name an occupational medicine uh, physician um, who would review the work of the IME and present their findings. Uh, now, work care, they did offer a physician, Dr. Aaron Grace, who, who specialised in occupational medicine, uh, but she didn't anticipate um, having to come to meetings in person as, as she actually lives out of state. Work Health Solutions, uh, they offered uh, Dr. Rajiv Doss. Uh, he actually served in the capacity of the medical board advisor um, for 12 years. Um, and he had uh, the most direct experience for all the proposers. Um, now, as outlined in the memo, uh, the cost of each of the vendors were compared. Um, but overall, the panel agreed that uh, to recommend work health solutions. Um, 
again, as Dr. Dross has more direct experience in this position, and they also have a very strong administrative team, which could possibly help to expedite uh, the processing of disability cases. And that uh, concludes my presentation. So, if I'm sort of hearing you right, let me jump in. If, let me jump in the first question. I'm sort of hearing you right, Barbara. We sort of don't have a decision here to make. Uh, we are um, recommending um, to approve the CEO to negotiate and execute with uh, Work Health Solutions. And, and, and by a broad margin, that's the choice, right? Yeah. Uh, floor is open. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, Drew, uh, <clears throat> I see uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the memos up there on the board, but I, we didn't get a chance to go all the way through, so I'm looking at it here, and it says that, that they didn't name a doctor to be visible at the, evidently at the hearings, but they'll maybe name one later. I'm assuming when Roberto <clears throat> gets to negotiating, uh, we're going to try to, I hope, follow the same format we had with you and I and our staff was that meeting so we can have uh, consultations and different things and have an expert there if needed. That's just one of many things I don't have every, I, I would imagine we're just, Roberto is just in a preliminary wanting to negotiate. Uh, Jake, uh, and I'll let Barbara address the question, but I think, yes, you are correct. Uh, we do expect to have a doctor there uh, just uh, similar to uh, how we did in the past with Dr. Chiman. Uh, Barbara, is there anything else you want to comment on that? No, uh, the process that we are recommending is um, uh, is the process that was in existence when Dr. Chiman was the board medical advisor. Um, this will just have now uh, Dr. Joss serving in that capacity. So Dr. Das, you may recall Dr. Das were with the uh, board and the committee for many years. Uh, until the city actually disbanded the uh, the medical section of the city, and that's when we ended up hiring Dr. Thurman for the last few years. So um, I think one of the pluses of uh, Work Health Solutions is the fact that Dr. Daz um, has not only experience on working with the committee and the board, but also understand um, the, the, the challenges and the requirements of the city charter uh, and disability requirements in the public arena and that there is a difference between uh, the process for determining um, disability uh, at this level vis-a-vis uh, -vis workers' compensation. So I think having that kind of knowledge uh, actually was very is very helpful and that was, uh, I don't want to speak for the for the community, but it was probably one of the main reasons uh, Work Health Solutions uh, is being recommended. Any other questions, Dick? You know, it's like anything else, you know, it's new, there's gonna be changes, like anything, you work through the flaws. I know it took us years to get where we're at today, and we really did a great job in terms of, of a conservative effort with by everybody uh, chipping in, especially uh, you, Drew. We, I mean, make things pretty simple. Uh, and that's what we want to do is keep it simple for the applicants. At the same time, if we have technical questions, try to resolve it there and, and not to endure a, a more cost and, and um, frustration for the applicants, but yet get to the, uh, the main thing of this whole thing is uh, that we make decisions based on the medical evidence. Yeah, agreed. Hey, Ray, is that, I see your hand up. Go ahead, jump in, Ray. You're on mute there. There. Go oh, sorry, Ray, we can hear you now. Go ahead. Just had a quick question. Is this Dr. Doss, the previous city physician? Is that the same person we're talking about? Correct, Ray. That is him. That's correct? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, that, that was the question I had. Thank you. Drew, I got a question for Barbara. And may I add uh, to Drew and to Ray and everyone else, and uh, Dr. Doss, I didn't understand all of it. I can tell you this. Uh, uh, the last year, we've worked very, very well together. And with Drew's help, we reduced uh, the number of applicants. We, we had a good work and relationship. I know that 
in the beginning, when we first got there, Dr. Doss was not perceived uh, as, as a left. And when he left, uh, things were, uh, well, while he was there at the end, it was very, very good. We, we were working well together. So that is some good news. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, this question uh, towards Barbara. I know in the in the, um, in the memo that you uh, that is written up summary, um, the work health solution also recommended or offered to provide the medical exams. Um, can you can you confirm that we're still sticking with the IMEs and that uh, the work health solutions will not be doing the medical exams? That's exactly correct. We will be using the board's existing IME providers, exam works, and meddling. Okay, thank you. I think, I think that's um, uh, an important um, thing to, to make sure that we have in place is that we still do the IMEs um, and independent medical exams and mm -hmm. not just uh, have you know, one doctor's you know, opinion on these. So uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate the clarification. And I also like to add, I know it's pretty self-explanatory in the memo, and I think Barbara indicated it, but can we look in, obviously, for your board support on staff recommendation? And this will be really to work on agreement for one year, for the fiscal year 21-22, with two one-year extensions options to extend beyond June 30, 2022. My point with that is we will use the first year as a parameter and experience. And if things are working as expected and the committee and the board and staff are happy with the process and the service, certainly we will pursue the one year extensions on the annual basis the following two years. But on the other hand, if it's not working as expected, we can always not that staff would like to issue another RFP, but if it's not working as extended, we wouldn't have to extend the contract and we will be just uh, pursue uh, another IFP at that point. I'm not expecting that will be the case, but I just wanted to make that point clear. Thank you. With that, Drew, I, I appreciate Roberto's input. That's helpful. This is Dick Santos' motion is to approve the negotiations. Go for it. Uh, great. Um, do you have a second for the motion? Gardner will second. Gardner will second. So I take the motion, um, Dick, to be what was the recommendation in the memo? Uh, let's go around the um, table. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Sunita? Aye. Uh, Howard? Yes. Ashvar? Aye. Franco? Aye. Nick? Yes. Vince? Aye. Dave? Dave, you still there? Dave, you're probably on mute. How do you vote, Dave? Aye. Uh, great, Dave votes aye. This is Drew, I vote um, aye as well. Um, oh, the last thing is the RS plan. Back to you, Roberto. And, uh, you're on mute, Roberto. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. Dad. I, I knew I was gonna do that at some point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, staff, can, can we get back to the agenda on the screen so I can read the item one more time, please? Yes, yeah, so um, Mr. Chair, we, um, as you know, you bore approved uh, last fiscal year, the uh, uh, strategic communications plan. And last February, um, we came before you to provide you with an update on how the strategic plan implementation uh, was ongoing. And at that point, we also promised to come back to your board every six months. And being that this is August and six months from the last presentation, we are back uh, before you to update you on the strategic communications plan uh, uh, process and how everything uh, is, is, is ongoing. So, um, to that extent, Barbara put together a, a short uh, document uh, indicating uh, what uh, of those uh, items have been implemented, what less to be implemented, and we attempted to provide a timeline. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Barbara for the presentation. Barbara? 
thank you. Yes. Um, so, as Roberto said, this is the update on the strategic plan for activities planned up to June 2021. Um, the activities did include, you know, um, the completion of the website redesign, uh, development contract for videography. Um, Barbara, I'm sorry. Barbara, I'm sorry to stop you. Is it possible? I don't know if it's you or staff as you speak to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, producing um, videos and additional webinars and launching of Facebook and Twitter accounts and hosting the state of the retirement system. Um, so, um, so for the uh, redesign, as, as Roberto, uh, the website redesign, as Roberto mentioned earlier, the newly redesigned off, um, website was launched in, in earlier this year in June. Um, uh, the staff also did make a presentation to the board just prior to the launch. Um, of course, updates to the website are continuing. Um, we're reviewing the website on you know, a weekly basis, sometimes even daily, to ensure we have you know, the necessary content and um, reviewing and updating existing content and, and obviously planning and creating new content uh, where it doesn't exist. Um, but the website is, is live. Um, uh, as far as developing a contract for videography, um, a contract hasn't been developed yet. However, we have started researching and we've researched and identified possible vendors. Um, for sure, producing the, the webinars and videos was proving uh, very time consuming. Uh, producing them in-house, uh, so um, we do think we'll need to pursue uh, a contract. Um, planning uh, some videos, we are currently working on reviewing and approving some scripts for videos. Uh, the videos haven't actually been created. Uh, these include uh, retirement application processing. Um, a video did exist, but it, it did feature the old website, and so obviously uh, we, we need to recreate that video and incorporate the new website now. Um, we also have uh, are developing a video on, on finding information for the HELPS program, which is um, a healthcare enhancement for public safety for those who uh, pay out of pocket um, expenses for insurance. Uh, and that video will help people um, find the information they need on our member direct. Um, we also have um, a series of webinars, including you know, our retirement uh, group counseling, in addition to the retirement planning workshops. Um, we also plan to rec produce recorded versions of these sessions uh, to be posted on the website. They haven't been made yet, but, but those are in the works. Um, and other possible topics are, of course, our upcoming open enrollment uh, vision in, vision insurance, dental insurance, information for those, um, and uh, transitioning to Medicare, thinking of retirement, you know, change of addresses, divorce, reciprocity, um, things like that. Um, again, we're going to be starting work on, on those. Um, we, we did launch our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Uh, they launched back in uh, May. And uh, we post multiple posts um, every week for each of the sites. The um, state of the retirement uh, system address video, that has not been created yet, uh, but um, we do plan to do that one early in 2022. And then as Roberto mentioned earlier, um, we have also published um, and distributed our retirement connection newsletter. Um, the next one will be published in October 2021. Um, I think that concludes for the strategic communication plan. Uh, thanks, Barbara. Any questions uh, on Barbara's update? Great. All right, let's go ahead and move on to then to retirements. Um, a brief note: um, we're going to take a quick break in 12 minutes. Uh, so the city can reset um, the recording. I think we'll be able to get through retirements and deaths. We've got a lot to go through here because we had no board meeting in July. Uh, the retirement of Greg, Gregory W. Alameda, fire captain, fire department, effective August 5, 2021, 25.52 years of service. Robert L. Bacon, Jr., battalion chief, fire department, effective August 7, 2021, 25. 
0.06 years of service. Scott Campbell, firefighter, fire department, effective September 2nd, 2021, with 25.61 years of service. Peter Caponio, fire captain, fire department, effective August 7th, 2021, with 26.52 years of service. Brian Endicott, fire captain, fire department, effective August 7th, 2021, with 25.05 years of service. Stephen P. Nelson, fire captain, fire department, effective August 7th, 2021, 26.05 years of service. And David J. Tyndall, deputy chief, police department, effective July 24th, 2021, 26.99 years of service with reciprocity. I uh, drive a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Santos. I have a second. Second, Gardner. Okay, I have a motion by Santos, second by Gar Gardner. Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Nita. Aye. Howard. Yes. Ashbar. Aye. Franco. Aye. Uh, Dick. Yes. Vince. Aye. Dave. I still be on mute, Dave. Dave. Aye. Oh, that's good. Thanks, Dave. Vote aye. This is Drew. I vote um, aye. Any words you want to say about these gentlemen, ladies? All gentlemen. And, uh, for me to uh, Drew, uh, many of these uh, what I call young people, I was uh, I worked with most of them this last uh, five years. Uh, I've been going about twenty. So of course, the best to all of them. I hope they uh, enjoy their benefits and uh, thank you for the service. Great, uh, Andrew. Go ahead. Yeah, Drew, this is Andrew. I want to say the same thing. Uh, worked with everybody um, on this, uh, all the um, everybody from the fire department on this list. Um, they were all uh, terrific firefighters, great um, contributors to the department, and provided great service. And I thank you. Um, hope you have a, a good um, retirement and a healthy one. Great. Uh, give me one second here. Um, hang on. Hang on. Uh, that's it. Okay. Hang on. Just got to get my agenda back up. It, uh, I, I shift pages. All right. Now we're going to go through the deaths. Uh, long notice, long list again. No board meeting in June. And then we'll have a moment of silence. Notification of the death of Robert Browning, police sergeant, retired July 3rd, 1993. It died June 18th, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Laurel Browning, spouse. Notification of the death of Alan Canepa, firefighter, retired September 2nd, 1987, died April 29, 2021, no survivorship benefits. A notification of the death of William P. Hackett, fire engineer, retired November 6th, 1991, died May 2nd, 2021, no survivorship benefits. Um, notification of the death of Jerry Mathis, fire engineer, retired April 6th, 1988, died May 8th, uh, 2021, survivorship benefits to Maria Mathis, spouse. Notification of the death of Thomas Perez, police lieutenant, retired September 22nd, 1995, died April 22nd, 2021, survivorship benefits to Estrella Perez, spouse. So this next one, I always look over these notices. <laughs> this guy joined the force before I was even born and by quite a number of years. Notification of the death of John Shar, firefighter, retired January 5th, 1982, died January 23rd, 2021, survivorship benefits to Dorothy Shar, spouse. We like to see guys that got full, almost 40 years of retirement. That's good. Notification of the death of William Sims, police sergeant, retired September 3rd, 1993, died January 4th, 2021, no survivorship benefits. Notification of the death of William B. Staples, assistant fire chief, retired August 5th, 2000, died May 18th, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Janice Staples, spouse. And notification of the death of Gary Zabrowski, fire engineer, retired January 31st, 2004, died March 2nd, 2021. Survivorship benefits to Judy Zabrowski, spouse. We'll now have a moment of silence. That's great. Uh, Dick, Andrew, uh, uh, Dave, Franco, don't know if you'll say anything about these, these gentlemen. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, even the police officers, I had an opportunity to work with both of them. And of course, I work with all the, the firefighters listed. It's sad to hear some younger and older, 
it's very sad, but they've given great service and the best of their families. And uh, it's very sad to hear. Thank you. You know, Drew, I, I, I just want to say that I, I did not personally work with any of these guys. They all came on, you know, or they retired a couple of years before I came on. Um, as, as much as it's sad to hear that they passed, I do like that they had a very long life in retirement and my condolences go to their family. Amen. Uh, Dave, Andrew, any comments? No, uh, condolences to you know to, to all to the families of, of these people that passed away. Um, sorry for your loss, and um, and our thoughts are with you. Great. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, committees. Um, any update uh, from you, Ashfar, in the investment committee? Yes, uh, we had uh, two meetings. Uh, one meeting of uh, the IC. Uh, this was on June on June twenty second. And then we had a joint IC on the 29th. Uh, the focus of the IC meeting was mostly on private markets. Uh, we had presentations, uh, you know, review of performance, Nikita and Newberger, um, review of risks that we have on a quarterly basis. Um, and we had to review the due diligence process, um, you know, kind of an audit we're, we're doing on an ongoing basis. And the joint IC was to discuss uh, venture capital and uh, the one thing I'll say, uh, just to you know, Sunita raised this uh, this issue, which is if any board member has any questions on what happens in the IC meetings, feel feel to reach out to me. Happy to discuss with you. Um, great. Let me note for the record that we are going to receive and file the minutes of the April 2021 uh, P and F Investment Committee and the April 2021 Joint Investment Committee. Um, any updates uh, from the audit committee, Howard? Um, so no, no updates. Um, our next meeting is co coming up in uh, two weeks. Great. Um, Roberto, you want to say anything about governance since Nick was the chair? Uh, Mr. Chair, I know we, um, we supposed to have, um, Tom available. Um, I don't know if we're going to need to. I can text him. Um, the the governance actually made uh, made a recommendation to approve the association plan policy. I uh, hope you all get a chance to review the memo uh, on 7.3 C that details specifically uh, what the recommendation for approval is. Uh, we can do one of two things. You boy can go ahead and approve it. If you have no questions, if you have any questions or would like to discuss it then uh mr chair we're going to have to go to the break to allow the city to do the the switch oh. at one o'clock and then come back and hopefully have time for uh discussion so whatever the board desire is i'm happy to proceed i mean we've discussed this in the past are do any board members um have any questions on item 7.3 c um the succession planning policy any questions? It's, it was pretty sure we talked about it before. Um, I'll move that we approve uh, the succession uh, planning policy. So Do move. I have a second? Santos, so move. Uh, for, uh, uh, mo motion by Lanza, second by Santos. Uh, Andrew, how do you vote? Aye. Uh, Sunita. Aye. Howard? Yes. Spar. Aye. Franco? Aye. Yes. Vince. Aye. Dave. Aye. And I'm Chair Trulanza. I vote aye. That passes. And let me note uh, that we are receiving and filing the minutes of the March 4th, 2021 Joint Governance Committee. Um, it is 12.58. Let's take a break until... 105, okay. given chance reset tape. We're almost done. We'll be done uh, probably. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Drew, I mean, you only have one minute left. You could go ahead and finish the meeting. There's nothing else other than the Joint Personnel Committee. I'm hoping to schedule a meeting for September and then any proposed agenda items, if you want to, if you can get it done in uh, a minute. No, I, I, think, I think that's a great idea. Um, let me note then for the record, we're receiving and filing 
um, the minutes from the April 5th, uh, 2021 Police and Fire Disability Committee and the Disability Committee dashboard. Thanks for pointing that out. Any public members have any comments? Speak fast. Great. Oh, Ray, you've got your hand up still? Yes. Yes. You there? Yeah. You didn't hear me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, on next month's agenda, you should have received a letter from me. Yeah. Uh, you want that on the agenda? Yeah. And I hope it's been distributed to the the rest of the committee, the rest of the members. It's important uh, on this PTSD. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll put it on. Yeah, Ray, let's put it on the agenda for next month. We'll make sure everybody has it. Okay. Please, I, I, please review that. I'll have more information at that meeting. I, I'm planning on attending the meeting. Right. So you have questions and whatnot, but um, we're just losing too many people. We're finding out now, and I'm personally finding out that PTSD, a lot of the guys wouldn't talk about it when they were on the job. They were considered weak. Not right, but that's just the view. That's just the view. That's the way it was viewed. Yeah. Now in retirement, I'm finding they're more willing to talk, but we don't have an avenue. No. So we yeah, it was, a well it was a well-written memo. Let, let's let's not talk about it here, Ray. Let's bring it up next month and spend real time on it. I appreciate that. You all have a good day now. Thank you, Ray. You too. Okay, I think that's it. Anything else, Roberto? No, I think that's it, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. All right, buddy. Have a good week. Thank you.